What's up, everybody? Fire Tribe, welcome to Rising from the Ashes. I'm Dan Unaki Dan, and I got a whole plethora of co hosts with me today. We got Indy Sage. What's up, Indy? Hey, what's happening? Glad to be here. We got Gabe, aka Slick Dissident, aka Slick Decadent, aka Enoch <laughs> Beckins. AKA Archangel playing, Gabriel. Playing Gabe. What's up, Gabe? Beep bop boop beep beep boop bop. <laughs> <laughs> That's his rope. We got AI Gabe. Sorry, I forgot about that one. And also on the show, we have Roman, the homie. What's up, homie? AKA Gator. Hey, buddy. AKA Snakeskin Boots, a.k.a. Uh, the one the, who gets fondled by Lilith, Lilithian. Uh, the hippy dippy <laughs> moke. Uh, Lilithian bloodites in their room at night when no one else is around and have no witnesses. So people think I'm crazy. I'm like, no, she was there and she sucked me dry. Whoa. <laughs> wow. Put some lotion on your skin. Would That's you? hot. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, we got the Morgan B. What's up, Morgan? Did you freeze again? And she did. Right when it was her turn. Uh, at least it's <laughs> at least it's a beautiful face. It caught, it caught her in a good moment. Yeah, she's yeah, smiling. Lucky. She's smiling. So today uh we are supposed to have Ralph Ellis on the show. Uh we are awaiting his arrival. So until then, if he shows up, when he shows up, we are just going to wrap kind of uh, more or less about like what he talks about in his books. Um, I think Morgan joined back with us now. How are you doing, Morgan? Say hello. 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 Sorry about that. It's all good. Right when I introduced you, you froze up. Of course. <laughs> uh, hey, guys. So, good to be here. There we hey. go. So uh, we're awaiting Ralph's arrival, so we're going to just kind of go over some of the topics that he talks about until uh, we get him on the show. Uh, so uh, some of the things that he does talk about is, you know, uh, this in his first book is Cleopatra to Christ and the relationship between Jesus and Cleopatra or Mary and Cleo. I think it's actually Mary who is the princess daughter granddaughter of Cleopatra. So um, I know we've already been talking for a while. I know everybody already has some stuff to say probably. So uh, I'll go straight to uh, Gabe because I know he's got some sauce. No. <laughs> right on. Yeah, man. Uh, so I have a theory that I'm hoping to maybe float across uh, Mr. Ellis's radar, see what he, how he feels about it. Um, and it's, a, it's very, it's, it's very oversimplified just, you know, for the sake of delivery, uh, uh, for presentation, it's a completely oversimplified idea because these family lineages, like we were saying, you know, they, uh, uh, they reuse the same name over and over. So when we talk about individual single persons, like when I use the word Ptolemy, it turns out there's like a, a baker's dozen of Ptolemies. And in between the Ptolemies, there were Cleopatras popping in, Cleopatra one through six, you know, and and the timeline is all over the place. But uh, so what I'm about to say is a very oversimplified version of the theory with no details whatsoever. But the theory goes something like this that the story of Typhon uh, storming across the landscape and sending the Greek pantheon into hiding in the lands of Egypt, uh, where Pan gave them refuge and told them to disguise themselves as animals so that Typhon would not recognize them. Uh, oh, here he is. Here he is. All right, I can uh, I can put it on pause and unpack it here in a second. <laughs> the man, the myth, the legend, the polymath. 
Ralph Ellis. Yeah, here he is, Rabbi Ralph Ellis. <laughs> on the show. Beautiful. I don't think he's fully in yet, so... Uh... Uh, I am, but I think I'm early. Am I not? Let's you're good. Look. You're good. Okay. You are always on time, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, happens. Mr. Ellis. It's a pleasure to meet you. Greetings indeed. Yes. Good to be uh, on the show. Let me see if I can get my camera doing the right sort of things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, sir. Does that globe behind you open up to uh, to a bunch of cigars? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's got a, a bottle of whiskey in, in there. Yeah. You're a little quiet, <laughs> Roman. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. I turned my gain down. How's that? Yeah. Better, yeah. Uh, so we were we've been talking kind of uh, about you, sir, and your book uh, Cleopatra to Christ, and uh, kind of been going over some some of the things that you have been talking about in that book. And so we would love to talk to you about it and uh, get fr the firsthand information because it's uh, really extraordinary what you're talking about in Cleopatra to Christ and. Uh, Pretty uh, amazing findings, uh, I would say, uh, like adjacent to the things that you have said in the book, I would say that we have kind of come to conclusions on also, but through a different way of getting there, uh, I, we were kind of taught, we have been talking about the immaculate conception of Mary and the red dress of Mary, and then how that relates to soap debt, and then to Isis and the Isis cult, and uh, the immaculate conception of and rituals of the Isis cults and whatnot. And then when I was listening to your book and reading your book, I noticed that there's some definite connections to Mary and Isis and whatnot in there. Uh, so if you if you could like kind of take us through. Uh, the story of uh, how we get Mary from Cleopatra and where it is that Jesus comes from. That would be a great starting point. Yes, there are many connections because I think this family came out of Egypt and therefore there would have been connections with Isis and, uh, you know, the mystery religions of Egypt. And yes, of course, she was a virgin because it says so in the um, uh, Protovogelum of James, I think it is, where she is um, said to be a, a vestal virgin. So she was a virgin in the temple. She was a vestal virgin. But of course, you didn't have to stay a virgin your whole life. She left when she was, I don't know, in her early teens, I think, and she was sold off to uh, Joseph. That's what it says in one of these apocryphal gospels. So there is always a sort of a rational explanation for what is claimed on occasions, like, you know, being a virgin. Um, well, she was, you know, temporarily when she was younger. Um, and yeah, so how do we get uh, this back into Egypt? Uh, this is a little bit convoluted. You have to understand um, how this story is connected to powerful people and uh, the dispute with Rome in Judea. Um, because, I mean, that, that was the whole essence of the gospel story. That's why he Jesus was jailed alongside revolutionaries who had committed murder during the revolution. And then you have to wonder which revolution was this? Uh, and it, it seems to be clear from most of my research that we're talking about the Jewish revolt here. So we're not talking about AD 20s and AD 30. We're talking about AD 60s and AD 70. Uh, we're talking about the Jewish revolt era. And what's happened is they forced this story back into the AD 20s uh, in order to divorce it from the Jewish revolt because they didn't want you to know that this story was about the Jewish revolt. The Romans didn't want you to know that anybody could revolt against Rome. I mean, that was forbidden for a start. Um, and so they moved the story backwards and no one's ever really seen 
that they've distorted this history like this in order to, to cover it up. Because if you knew this story was in the 8060s, you would instantly know who this Jesus character was. Because there weren't very many players in this uh, Jewish revolt. Um, it was basically, it was the, uh, the kings and the princes of Adiabeni Edessa. Josephus Flavia says so. And so we're looking perhaps to a link with the Adiabenan Edessans, who was a royalty from northern Syria, a very powerful, very influential, very wealthy royalty uh, in northern Syria in the first century. And it was the history of this family that I started investigating uh, because they seemed to be connected uh, to this revolt somehow. Uh, we have this from Josephus, so I knew about this quite some time ago. Um, the best illustration that they are connected is the beheading of John the Baptist. So we have this story not just from the Gospels, but also from real history, from Josephus Flavius. Um, and he says that this, this beheading was caused um, by... Uh, Herod Antipas, who was one of the tetrarchs of Judea, um, divorcing his wife and sending her back to Petra. She was the daughter of King Aretas of Petra. And she was divorced and sent home, and then Herod Antipas could marry Herodias. And it was for that reason, because John the Baptist criticized this marriage, that he got his head chopped off. Well, because of that, King Aretas of Petra sent an army up to Judea to go and punish the Judeans. And Josephus says that they were joined by some fugitives from Syria. And immediately you know that something is wrong here because Josephus knows exactly what's going on. So why will he not name this particular group of people, this army that defeated uh, Herod Antipas? Well, the answer is, is because it's contentious. Um, and we get the answer from the Syriac historians like Moses of Corinne, who says that these fugitives was the army of Edessa. OK, so now we know what this story was about. It was the army of Edessa and Petra who defeated the Judeans. This is in about AD 35. But that tells us quite a lot because it tells us that Josephus Flavius has deleted the Edessan royalty from history completely. There is no mention of them whatsoever in the works of Josephus, um, apart from this, you know, um, covering up of their name by calling them fugitives. Um, and it also means that Edessa is closely involved in this story, because why were they there having this battle in Judea? Um, we know why Aretas of Petra was there, because his daughter had been spurned and sent back home again. But why was the Edessan army down there? Well, it says in the works of Moses of Corinne, this is, was vengeance for the death of John the Baptist. So we know that somehow John the Baptist was connected to the royal family of Edessa the royal family that's been deleted from history, which is why nobody knows anything about them. Um, so what I had to set about doing was investigating the history of Odessa. Um, and it's, it's a city-state that sort of grew in the first century. Moses of Corinne says it was uh, formed in the first century. Um, and it seems to have been formed from exiles coming out of Parthia, out of Persia. How did they get there? Well, I think this goes back into Roman history. So this is a little bit tentative, but it makes sense. And it's borne out by some of the uh, accounts from Josephus Flavius. Um, and the problem was that uh, when um, Julius Caesar was killed, on the Ides of March, which was, uh, when was that, 44 BC, I think it was, um, Cleopatra was pregnant. And we have that from Cicero, who says that she was pregnant and she fled from Rome and disappeared off back to Egypt. 
um, because she was in danger. Her husband, as it were, had just been killed. And he is worried because Cleopatra is pregnant. And he's hoping that Cleopatra will have a miscarriage. Well, later on, a few months later, he writes a letter and saying um, that the crisis is over because he was fearing that there would be what he calls a scion of Caesar, an heir of Caesar who would claim the throne of Rome. And they didn't want an Egyptian heir from Cleopatra becoming the next emperor of Rome. That's what they were afraid of. But anyway, the crisis um, passes. And why did it pass? Well, either Cleopatra had a miscarriage or the child was a girl because a girl could not become emperor of Rome. Right. So we have this lost daughter of, of uh, Cleopatra and Caesar running around. And um, so what happened to that daughter? Well, we, we move on 20 years or so. So when she was, you know, late teens, and now we have um, uh, Augustus, uh, Octavian Augustus is now Caesar, as it were. And he's sorting out his borders, having just become emperor. And so to Yuba II, who is the king of Mauritania in northern Africa, uh, he gives Yuba II Cleopatra Selene, who was the daughter of Cleopatra from uh, Mark Antony. And that's a real marriage. We know about this. They were king and queen of Mauritania, and they've got a huge, great uh, mausoleum over in uh, modern Libya, uh, which is well worth seeing. But I've still not seen it because it's always been such a troubled part of the region of that region. So um, I, I will at some point manage to get over there. Um, and then he goes to his eastern borders uh, to Phraates the Fourth, who is the king of Parthia, Persia who is a really, really powerful king of a really powerful nation because uh, it was the Parthians who had defeated the Romans on three previous occasions, including defeating um, uh, Mark Antony and, and taking all of their standards and so on from the Roman army. So this was a really powerful king and Augustus had to really do something special for this king. And so what does he do? Well, according to Josephus Flavius, he gives Phraates IV a prostitute, a courtesan, called Theamusa, or Thermusa, or Theamusa Orania. And you think, well, that's not right. Um, that's not going to pl placate um, the, the mighty king of Parthia by giving, her a big, by giving him a, a prostitute, effectively. Um, so we need some interpretation here. And it's quite obvious uh, because this courtesan, this prostitute, he was so enamored by her that he made her the chief queen of all of Parthia. And her name is Queen Thea Musa Orania. And she became the queen of Parthia. And so there's something wrong with the story here. And it's quite obvious from the research I've done that this uh, Thea Musa was the lost daughter of Cleopatra. So what uh, Octavian was doing was giving away two daughters. One daughter of Cleopatra went to North Africa and the second daughter went to Parthia to become the queen of Parthia. And she's known in history of uh, uh, as being Queen Thea Musa Orania and everyone thought this was a ribald story from Josephus that was just um, uh, a complete fiction until they started finding her coins all across uh, that region. And they found a statue, which I might be able to give you a picture of later. Um, and so it's, it was quite obvious to me that she was the daughter of Cleopatra. Now, she didn't last that long in Parthia. Uh, it was said via Josephus again, it was said that she killed her husband, she poisoned him, uh, in about uh, 2 BC, and became the full queen of Parthia with her son, Phratases. Um, but they were kicked out of 
Parthia in AD 4. And they moved across into Syria. And I think this was the founding of the city and the principality of Edessa. And within that story, we have the nativity. What is the nativity? Because the nativity is a rather unbelievable sort of story. It's, it's a story of a king, and we know he was a king because Jesus is called a king on like 36 occasions, coming um, out um, coming out of the east, going into Judea, uh, and being uh, visited by the Persian Magi, the three kings. Now, why would the Persian Magi go to visit a Jew in Judea or Syria, um, you know, who was supposed to be the son of a carpenter, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is, we'll go into that in a minute. The story doesn't make sense. You've got this king who is, for some reason, poor, and therefore in a stable, not in a palace, being visited by the Persian Magi. That is the um, nativity story. But of course, in the story of Thea Musa Orania, that is the story we have. We have a king and a queen coming out of Parthia. They are, as it were, poor because they had nowhere to stay. It turned out that they had a lot of money with them, but they didn't have a palace. And so they were having to stop in uh, poor uh, lodgings. And of course, this was a family who would be visited by the Persian Magi because any son born to them would have been a potential king of Parthia, let alone Rome and uh, Judea and Greece as well and Egypt, but would have been a potential king of Parthia. And that's why the Persian Magi came to this birth. So the nativity story, although it is rather unbelievable, might actually be based upon real history. And that's the, the real history of the setting up of Edessa as a principality. And it was deliberately set up, again, according to Josephus, it was deliberately set up as a buffer state in between Rome and Parthia. Because these two empires had clashed so often and so many armies have been destroyed and defeated um, that they rather wanted a buffer state in between the two, an independent buffer state, uh, a bit like sort of Ukraine is now between America and, and uh, Russia. And we have this buffer state who's supposed to keep the peace in between the two, but not really keeping the peace at present. But that was the role of, um, of Edessa at that time. So and I, they, I, yes, I have, a, I have a question. So this is the Odessa of modern day on the on the edge of the Black Sea. Like it's uh, still no. map. OK, no, where, this where is was... Edessa, not not Odessa. So Edessa okay. is uh, San Lurfa, which is in is just north of Aleppo. Uh, wow. It's in modern Turkey and it's called San Lurfa. Um, but originally it was called Antioch Odessa. Um, and it got that name because that was the original name of the capital city of the Macedonians. And of course, it was Macedonian when Alexander the Great came through that region and took over the whole of uh, modern Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and so on. He took over the whole of that region and northern India, of course. He became the king of northern India. Um, all of those regions gained Greek names like Alexandria, you know, there's Alexandria's all over the place. Um, but another name that they took with them was Edessa. And so that city became known as Edessa. And in the works of Josephus, Josephus, again, covers this up because he will not mention Edessa. So what he does is he mentions Adiabeni. And OK, but there's no archaeological evidence for Adiabeni whatsoever. <clears throat> and everyone, if you read this in history, in modern history, everyone will be talking about Adiabeni. I don't think Adiabeni ever existed. It was a pseudonym because Josephus Flavius was not allowed to mention the forbidden name Edessa. And so, you know, lots of people have been arguing about this, but Moses of Corinne, who's the Syriac uh, historian, about mm, 7th century, I think he is, is quite clear 
that Queen Helena, the very famous Queen Helena of Adiabeni, was married to King Abgarus of Edessa. And so at the very least, you have to say that these two principalities were linked by marriage. But I don't think Adiabeni ever existed. I think it was just a pseudonym for Edessa. And this was the uh, powerful royal family that was very influential in, um, uh, in, in biblical history. And we know this for several reasons. Um, we know this because um, we have a quote from Acts of the Apostles, um, which says that uh, it's talking about the famous famine. Now, we had this famous famine, which is at about AD 49. So again, it's after, <laughs> after the time of uh, Jesus's normal um classical life um where queen helena of adiabeni edessa gave famine relief money down to judea uh, to relieve the famine there and on the back of that famine relief money money she became the queen of judea effectively the de facto queen of judea she became the queen of the jews and she had the largest palace and the largest tomb in Jerusalem, and uh, she furnished the Temple of Jerusalem. She bought the solid gold menorah for the Temple of Jerusalem. This family were very, and, and they were Jews. Queen Helena became a Nazarene Jew. Um, so, you know, we, we know quite a lot. This comes from the Talmud, so we know quite a lot uh, about them, and from Josephus, who mentions Queen Helena. But then we get in Acts of the Apostles, we get this uh, two verses which say, there stood up one of them. This is Acts 11.28. Uh, there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the spirit that there would be a great famine throughout the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. We think this is about AD 49-ish, something like that, AD 50 maybe. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, uh, determined to send famine relief money down to Judea, which they did, and they sent it to the elders in Judea by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Which is interesting because many uh, people like Robert Eisenman and myself think that Agabus was King Abgarus of Edessa. So he does get a mention in the gospel story, but only in code. They've changed the name slightly, and they've done this deliberately because Agabus in the Greek can be taken to mean the locust. So they've changed his name from Ab Abgarus to Agabus because Agabus means locust. Um, and they do this to denigrate the person, this king, because they thought the Edessans were like the locusts of the plagues. And so everywhere you find this name, every time you find Edessa, they call them the locusts. Because like the locusts of the plagues, they came out of the east and destroyed the Temple of Jerusalem. They destroyed Judea and sent the Jews into exile, which is what happened you know, during the plagues. Um, and so this is a, you know, it's a deliberate play on words in order to denigrate these people because they think that they caused the Jewish revolt, which caused the destruction of the temple and the exile of the Jews all out of Judea. That's why they call them locusts. Um, so here is a mention of the king of Edessa. But the interesting thing is it says that the money was taken from King Abgarus by Saul and Barnabas. So Saul, this is St. Paul, of course, Saul was an ambassador of Edessa. That is how close this city is to the biblical story. He was an ambassador of Edessa, and yet that's never mentioned, of course. This is all had to be covered up because the authors of these Gospels and the author of, you know, Josephus Flavius was not allowed to mention 
the forbidden city of Edessa because they started the Jewish revolt and therefore the Romans didn't want anyone mentioning their name whatsoever. They were just deleted from history whatsoever, completely. Um, if it wasn't for the Syriac historians, we would know nothing about them. And this is interesting in another fashion because um, this is all to do with um, uh, Antioch. So these people were supposed to be up in Antioch. Uh, it, it says in the, the verse before, that, and in these days, the prophets uh, from Jerusalem came unto Antioch. Now, it's always been assumed that Antioch means Antakya on the Mediterranean coast. So up in the sort of northeast corner of the Mediterranean, um, which is now modern Antakya, that is known as uh, Antioch Arontz. However, Edessa was called Antioch. So when these disciples are going backwards and forwards in Acts of the Apostles for the Council of Jerusalem and all of the other things that were going on, and it continually says that they were going backwards and forwards to Edessa, sorry, to Antioch, they were probably referring to Antioch Edessa, the very influential city beyond the Euphrates, as Josephus calls it, um, who was involved in this in this gospel story, but also involved in the Jewish revolt. Um, <clears throat> question about uh, some of the etymology of the name Antioch that kind of has a, it, it seems like it's teeming with <clears throat> some like symbology just in the name itself. Like I'm hearing like anti arc or archangel or the, um, <clears throat> the arc stone or, um, <clears throat> you know, uh... Ark, Ark is coming in that. So I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you know any etymology on that name. It, it, I think it just comes from the uh, the Greek king again. It comes from Antiochus. Um, so again, like Alexander the Great, who took his name all over the East, and you get all of these Alexandrias or Skanders um, all over sort of, you know, Iran and Pakistan and so on. Everything is called Skander. Um, well, Antiochus took over that realm from Alexander the Great. And so you get an awful lot of Antiochs. So this was the, uh, the he, he was, was not actually a king. He was a, um, he was a Greek commander of the army who took over that region after the death of Alexander the Great and assumed the role of, of the king of that region. And so you get Antiochs all over the place. Um, but one of those Antiochs was, um, uh, was Antioch Edessa which is just beyond the Euphrates, which is a common phrase used by Josephus Flavius. So Josephus Flavius, when he's talking about the, um, the Jewish revolt, he's always talking about the Jews beyond the Euphrates. And everyone has assumed this is talking about uh, Adiabeni, but I don't think it's talking about Adiabeni at all. I think it's talking about Edessa, which did lie beyond the Euphrates. And they were Jewish because Queen Helena had converted to Nazarene Judaism uh, in the AD 50s. And of course, Jesus and uh, Peter, is it Peter? No, Jesus and Paul were both known as Nazarenes. So they are of the same sect as well. Queen Helena of Edessa was a Nazarene, the same as Jesus was a Nazarene. So are the Essenes, multiple connections. Are the Essenes and Nazarenes connected at all? I think yes. they're connected. We don't know this directly, but these people who I believe were what Josephus calls um, the Babylonian Jews who came out of Parthia. We're talking about the same story again of people coming out of Parthia at this time. The Babylonian Jews... Um, the second in command of the Babylonian Jews was known as Zadok. And the Essene were known as the sons of Zadok. So there is a direct connection there. And also the Essenes set themselves up as a sort of remote, like a monastic sort of community. And the Nazarene uh, came out of the Nazarites, the Old Testament Nazarites, and the Nazarites means to separate, 
to separate off. And Nazarene means to separate as well. And by that, I, I take it what it means is to be like a monk and go and separate yourself off from society uh, and form something like uh, the Essene down on the, uh, uh, mm -hmm. at Qumran on the shores of the Dead Sea. Like the Manasseh and So I Irish. think, yes, quite possibly, yep, yeah, they were Nazarene, yeah. The Essene Nazarenes, I think that's very, very likely. Well, if you just think about like even what like an essence or a scene means, like it just means like the way that other people view you, like to be closed off or, you know, taken into the forest or whatever, you know, like a, I, a I, communist society. Well, the, the, you know, the Church of Jesus and James was communist, of course. Um, it's they absolutely lived out of the commie. common purse. And we have the story of um, uh, Ananias and Sophia. Uh, this is not taught much in church because it's a little bit controversial. Uh, they wanted to join the Church of Jesus and James. And they were accused of keeping some of their money back. They, they held some property and didn't give it to the church. So St. Peter killed them both because they hadn't given all of their money to the church. This is how communist they were. You had yes. to give the money over uh, to the church. And if people haven't, uh, I'll just look up a... Not uh, even like when you think of communism, like sickle and hammer, like North Korean or Russian, like it's not even like that. It's like... Oh, it's, just, it's as bad as yeah, North Korea. This is real North Korean stuff. Yeah, um, this, it's horrible. It's yeah, horrible communism that was happening. This comes from Acts 5.1. Um, in fact, it's quite a long section. It goes on for about 20 verses. Um, but it's a man named Ananias and his, his wife, uh, Sephira. And they sold a possession. And they sold some property, basically. And they kept back a part of the price. Um, and Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Ananias, on hearing these wor words, fell down dead. And then his wife is, is killed later. So, you know, basically they were both uh, killed because they didn't give all of their money to the Church of Jesus and James. This is how strict it was. It was very, very similar, of course, to the Knights Templar. You had to do the same if you joined the Knights Templar, because the Knights Templar was based upon the Church of Jesus and James. In mm -hmm. fact, the community rule, funnily enough, the community rule of the Knights Templar is the same as the community rule of the Essenes. Yeah. And they found both of these because they found that community rule. It was in a synagogue in, uh, in Egypt. And would you believe it had been preserved for like, you know, 1800 years and it was sitting in this synagogue. Um, so they have the community rule of both of these societies and they were very, very similar. But uh, yeah, with the Knights Templar, you had to give up all of your money to become a Templar. And, As you uh, go rob other it. countries for their wealth. Well, no, they would take the Knights Templar were taking back Christian lands. Remember, all of these lands had been Christian for uh, a thousand years. So all of um, the Near East, all of much of Iraq, all of modern Turkey, Anatolia, all of Na North Africa, all of these lands had been Christian lands. Is that uh, why you and find a lot of text like dug up in like clay pots there? Is that why there's a lot of either Gnostic oh, yes. or is, this, is this that was the why? center of Christianity? Remember, this was the center of the um, uh, Byzantine Empire, which was a Christian empire. So all of the East was Christian and it had been taken over by the armies of Muhammad in, in the seventh century who went through that region like a, a knife through butter. They just went through in a, like about 50 years and took over the whole of that region and oppressed them because, of course, Islam relies on slavery. Well, they don't call them slaves. They call them dhimmis. And if you are an unbeliever, then you're a dhimmi slave, as it were. or A serf, I think, would be a better word, a serf. A dhimmi serf to your Muslim overlords. And you have to abide by the, um, uh, the covenant of dimitude. 
which is highly restrictive as an unbeliever. Um, there are many, many things you cannot do as an unbeliever. But one of the things you had to do, of course, was pay all the taxes. So the whole of the society uh, within the Ottomans, well, the early uh, Umar, but then the Ottoman Empire later on, the whole of that society was run on the backs of uh, taxes from the unbelievers. Mm -hmm. And that's why they had this golden age of Islam at that time, because there were still a lot of unbelievers in that region. But of course, once all over, because it was so oppressive, that you either moved out of the region or, or you died out, basically. So the, the, the numbers of unbelievers in these regions got less and less and less as time went on. And that's when Islam collapsed because they no, had, no longer had anyone to live off the backs of. Um, so, yeah, that's why the Crusaders went over there to uh, liberate these people from Muslim oppression. And that's what the um, Crusades were all about. And while we're on this... Of course, the first crusade was rather interesting because the, th the first crusade was organized in uh, 1096 by Count Baldwin of Boulogne, who was obviously a Norman, um, a Norman knight and a Norman lord. And um, so the first crusade goes out across the east. It goes across Anatolia. It gets to Antioch, the, um, the first Antioch, which is Antioch, Antakya. And it doesn't go to Jerusalem. I mean, it should be turning south and going to Jerusalem, but it didn't. It carried straight on. It went across the Euphrates into Mesopotamia. And guess what the first city was that they liberated from Muslim control? That was Edessa. So mm. the first crusade did not go to Jerusalem. It went to Edessa. And you've got to ask yourself, why... Why on earth did they go to Odessa? Um, it's because they probably knew there was something interesting about Odessa. And if you were going to find any history, any genealogies, any artifacts, uh, any texts, the place you were going to find them was not in Jerusalem. It was in Odessa. And that's why they went there first, because they, they knew all about this before they went, because I've just been researching the Church of Edessa in India. Um, now, I didn't know this until recently, but there's an Edessan church in India, uh, down in southwestern uh, India, called Malabar. And uh, this is the church of St. Thomas. But Thomas, Thomas was one of the disciples, of course. He's Thomas Did Didymus. Um, but according to the... Um, uh, according to the Nag Hammadi Gospels, Thomas was Judas. So his full name was Judas Thomas Didymus Labaius Thaddeus. And he was the twin brother of Jesus. So Jesus had a twin. And he was sent to India mm -hmm. to go and evangelize to the Indians. And he set up the Malabar Church, which is why we have the Malabar Church uh, down in southwestern India, even to this day. Um, but they say he came from Edessa. And so in, in, in the fourth century, when that church was failing, um, what they did is they sent the bones of, of uh, St. Thomas back to Edessa with a message saying, can you send some more people because we're running out of people here. And so they sent 350 people from, Ed from Edessa in the fourth century to go to India to repopulate the church of St. Thomas in India. So, and all of this was known way back before the first crusade, because um, I don't know if you know English history at all, but Alfred the Great, who was a very famous king from the South of England, ninth century, pretty much, he sent the Bishop of Salisbury to India uh, to go and see the Edessan Church of St. Thomas in India and take um, alms, he's, he says, tribute um, to them in order to sustain them. Um, this was in the ninth century. They knew all about this way back then. And so, of course, by the time we came to the First Crusade, they knew all about Edessa. 
we don't seem to know anything about it now <laughs> but in those days they did and of course they, they would have realized that if if saint thomas came from odessa and he was the twin brother of jesus well where did jesus come from <laughs> probably from the same city and it so happens of course that in the first century the leader of the Edessans who started the Jewish revolt was called King Isus Manu. And of course, that's the same name as we get from the Gospels, because we have um, we have this very strange verse from Matthew uh, 123, which says, oh, what happened there? <laughs> I went into full screen mode for GPT. some reason. <laughs> yeah. No, I am. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm just showing a map of where San Lu. Ah, oh, that's Lerfa, uh, that's why it disappeared. Okay. Odessa, Odessa is, and showing it in uh, context to where it is located oh, at cool. for people to yeah, so we so can people understand can see where it of, is. Thank yes. you. Now, were there two Odessa? Good idea. So, um, if if you go from the Y in Syria. Oh, it might even be oh, there it is go out a bit san lerfa there we go on the top left you see san lerfa which is now in the center san lerfa that is um edessa so its modern name is san lerfa um and uh it was officially in syria in those days nowadays it's in uh, turkey and their empire stretched from san lerfa to diabakia to the right of it you'll see diabakia uh, that was known as Amida. Just yeah, that's the one. That was known as Amida. That's on the Tigris. Um, and then their their little empire went south from there, past Raqqa, um, all the way down to uh, Palmyra, which is not marked here. It's it's mm. just below the A in Syria is Palmyra. Um, and so it, it was. <laughs> It was quite a largish sort of little principality because it's the same size as, as England is nowadays. Yeah, Palmyra is out in the desert just to the north uh, east of Damascus. Probably that little green bit there where, below the Y in Syria, there's a little tiny green bit. Mm -hmm. That's probably Palmyra because Palmyra is the only oasis in the whole of that desert. That's all desert lands apart from Palmyra. Now, was this the forbidden Odessa? You mentioned Adiabena. Was that a different place? Adiabeni. Um, Adiabeni is supposed to be over by Mosul. I think on the right-hand side, you see an M there. I think that's Mosul. Is that Mosul just there? Yeah, that's Mosul. So Adiabeni was supposed to be over by Mosul, which is a lot further and deeper into uh, modern Iraq. And I very much doubt whether, because the Roman army later on is supposed to have gone to Adiabeni. And yeah, the Roman army could have gone to San Lerfa, Edessa, but I, I don't think there's any way the Roman army could have gone as far as, as Erbil. Oh, there it is. Erbil is supposed to be Adiabeni. Oh, it's gone again. You're going in and out. Mm -hmm. uh, um, just below Mosul. There it is. Uh, there you go, Erbil. Um, so that is a long way down into modern Iraq. And I'm not entirely sure that the Roman army could have gone that far into Iraq without coming across the uh, Parthian army and getting totally destroyed. And yet they seem to regularly stroll into that region and go down to um, Adiabeni, which is Erbil. Um, and I think that they're not really talking about Adiabeni or uh, Bill, I think they're talking about top left here where you see San Lerfa, which is Edessa. I think that's what they're talking about. They're talking about Ed, um, because that's where this monarchy lived. And when they're talking, when, when the Gospels uh, and, and various other sort of religious type texts talk about these events, they talk about uh, Antioch Edessa. They're not talking about Adiabeni, and they're talking about um, Agabus or Abgarus. They're not talking about Adiabeni. So I think 
I mean, it doesn't actually make uh, much of a difference to the <laughs> thesis, but I think this is what we're talking about, is this buffer state between Rome and Parthia. Now, you mentioned um, but, the Templar earlier. I wanted to ask, um, oh, you can go on if you were going to say something. Well, it's, it's just the name of this person, um, <clears throat> because it says in, um, uh, no, I didn't want that. I wanted, um, uh, e man. I wanted this verse from Matthew 123, which says, uh, this is the verse that um, that makes Jesus, as it were, the, the Messiah. Uh, Matthew 123, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and she'll bring forth a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel. And you think, well, you know, this is supposed to be a prophecy, which means that Jesus is going to become the Christ, going to become the, the Messiah. But it's a, the most stupid prophecy ever in the history of prophecy, because Jesus was never called the, uh, never called Emmanuel, not once in the whole of the uh, New Testament. So why on earth do we have this prophecy uh, when that wasn't his name? Well, I think this, these are not simply, these are not prophecies. These are, this is a play on words in order to prove mm -hmm. to people who were initiated into the secrets that this is what we were talking about, that we were talking about the kings of Edessa. Because the king of Edessa was called Manu. Jesus, Manu. And the name of Jesus was Jesus Emmanuel. And so you can just whisper into someone's ear and say, yeah, the king was called Manu. Ah, that's what it means. Emmanuel. Now I know what that prophecy was all about. Um, it's saying, behold, a virgin will be with child. And she was from Edessa and her son will be called Manu because that was the name of the son uh, of uh, the grandson of Queen Helena. And of course, the um, the kings of Edessa all wore a crown of thorns. So we have another direct relationship. Um, I don't know if I can do a quick share screen. If I find um... so, the image of Edessa is interesting, right? Because um, <clears throat> the motif is the face of Jesus uh, that they would carry around. Uh, and that we were talking earlier about the Knights Templar and the classic motif of there being a worshiping of a head. They're not very yes. loud. Um, and using it, using it. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the image of Edessa being, you know, the face of Jesus being uh, uh, significant, literally called the image of Edessa. And then we were talking earlier about the Knights Templar, who is classically motifed with uh, worshiping a head um, or a face or triple face or what have you um <clears throat> it seems to be like a another motif or an homage uh being paid to that uh what, what, what do you have to say on on that in the image of Edessa? yeah this is this is the mandelion so this comes from the uh, doctrine of adai which is a later document second century which talks about Edessa. so again Edessa was was well known um in these early eras and it's saying that King Abgarus, the same king we were talking about, uh, was ill. And so he wrote to Jesus and said, you know, can you come and heal me? And he said, no, I'm too busy, uh, but I can send you this letter and I can send you a disciple, an apostle. And so they sent Adai, who is most probably Thaddeus. And Thaddeus, uh, of course, is uh, Judas Thomas Thaddeus. Uh, the brother of Jesus. And so Adai goes up to Edessa. Um, and then a, an ambassador from Edessa comes down to Judea with letters from King Agbarus. Um, and yeah, because Jesus could not go back up to Edessa to cure the king, um, he made a painting. So in the first edition of this uh, document, the guy actually made a painting 
with the was choices. It said it was of not paints. made by human hands, or it was divine. Yeah, that's a later painted. tradition. This is this is how these things get um, embellished in later years. So the original ah, story is that he actually made a proper painting and took that back to Odessa. And then, of course, in later versions, they say this becomes the veil of Veronica, basically, where they, they put a handkerchief, which is known as a mandelion. I'm not sure what language that is in, actually. It's probably Aramaic. Um, they put a, a handkerchief on the face of Jesus, and this face got imprinted uh, miraculously upon this, uh, this handkerchief. And that is the story of, of the Mandalayan of Edessa. And of course, that was taken back to Edessa. And that's why Edessa became the um, blessed city, because it had this miraculous, um, supposedly, image of Jesus. But of course, in more rational terms, uh, if Jesus was down in Judea, which we think he was, because these princes were sent away for their education. And because Queen Helena was the queen of Judea, she had moved her palace down to Judea in order to take over that region as well, because they were expanding their empire, making it much, much larger, twice as large, because it now encompassed all of Judea. So she had the largest palace down there in, in uh, Judea. Um, so if the king was still up in Edessa, and we know he was in Edessa because he was banned from traveling by Rome. Rome refused to allow him to travel because they didn't trust these um, puppet kings that they controlled. And so he wasn't allowed to move out of Edessa. But his sons, obviously, and his wife, obviously, were. Um, so if Jesus was down, Jesus, King Jesus Manu, or Prince Jesus Manu, as he would have been, was down in Jerusalem, of course, the king would have wanted a picture of him. And so he would have sent his ambassador down to uh, Jerusalem to get a picture of his, you know, how famous his son was becoming in that region mm -hmm. and took that painting back to Edessa. And that became the legend of uh, the Veil of Veronica or the uh, Mandelion, which was taken back to Edessa. Now, if you read that in the Doctrine of Adai, it has to adjust the names in order for it to become the AD 20s. Because in tr classical chronology, Jesus died in AD 30 or 33. But if you read the, um, uh, the governors of Syria that it's talking about, um, uh, Sabinus, I think it was, they made a complete faux pas there because they didn't change the name of the governor of Syria. And the governor of Syria is from the AD 50s, not from the AD 20s. So they've messed up the chronology. Um, because they were sloppy, basically. They changed the name of the emperor, but they didn't change the name of the um, governor of Syria. And this you know, is why I think all of this happened in the 1860s. Yeah. So a couple of things are kind of uh, lighten up for me. Um, the name Emmanuel in reverse is a Lou name. And Lou has uh, quite a few, because we're talking about his name and his likeness like his face being captured uh, in trying to, you know, recreate his likeness. The uh, Lou has quite a few meanings. Place, so place name in reverse, Emmanuel, place name comes up. Also, mm -hmm. um, uh, these are just a, a list of quick definitions for Lou, and these are multi-sourced. Life, the universe, and everything. The left upper extremity. Uh, limited user evaluation, living unit equivalent, and then a Luxembourg franc, which is part of a currency uh, code, which became the euro. And then another one is has to do with money again, the basic monetary mm. unit of Moldovia and Romania. Oh. And so I just think it's interesting that we have this Lou, this likeness, this face, and the name, the place name, and we're trying to capture the image of a king which is always put on currency. So I think there's Absolutely. an interesting thread when when you reverse Emmanuel. Lou, Lou is also mm -hmm. Lucifer, and uh, he is the god of light. So, uh, Oh, and yeah, because you said Lux and Lux and having that light motif as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure Lou is the... Um, this is for from uh, John McHugh. Uh, he has pointed out that the... Aries character, who is the laborer or the worker, 
uh, he's literally the constellation Aries. One of its names is Lou. Uh, so I just think that's interesting that Emmanuel becomes Lou name. And it's like, mm -hmm. who's going to take, the, who's going to be the placeholder? Who's going to play the role of this, uh, this, this principal character in the station of Aries, which was the pagan new year at one point. That's funny. Cause it reminds me of like, if you're talking of Celtic mythology or like folklore and you yep, talk about Lou. them. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And, and all of the King Louis bloodlines as well. Yep. <laughs> and he shall have no name. Oh, right. And it also has to, Oh, go ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say, has my screen share come up on there at all? No, it just uh, no, says that. It, um, it's this, but it's black. Yeah, it, it says you have started approval. screen share, no. but it's just a blank screen. Uh, okay, let me stop that and try again. Um, so, if I... After after yeah, this uh, screen share, Ralph, I really want to ask you a question that I've been teaming to ask since <laughs> we started. I think it'll help give some uh, some I I because it, it dates back further to the the founding of Rome and stuff. So um, mm. I just want to throw that out there and ask your opinion on that. And after um, we this. Well, I'm trying to uh, share, and I'm not sure that anything is actually coming up. Um, yeah, it's not. It's saying it's it says my sharing is paused, but I, it's not really. Not really saying why. Resume share. So if I resume it. If you want to uh, post the link in the chat, I can share it on my side as well. A link. Uh, yeah, copy and paste the, the link that you're sharing. Yeah, but it's a file, not a link. So, oh. but I could, I could get one. If, if, well, if you want to just uh, do a Google search yourself, uh, image search for coin of King Abagaras, of Odessa, okay. uh, and you will find several different uh, versions. Uh, let me see if I can find a link. Let me see. That's a that's a heck of a name, Abagaris. I got it. Yeah, I got I'm, it pulled I'm up being here. rather pedantic over the um, pronunciation, but he's called he's called different things. Yeah, it's the first one, Daily Mail. Oh, that's <laughs> that's from my yeah. Okay, that that was my article in the Daily Mail. Um, so okay, so I'm looking for where the chat is. Where's the chat? <laughs> I can't even find the chat. Oh, chat. There we go. It's right in the middle. There we go. So if I do that and share that, you should get that uh, image come across. Um, is he, is he yeah, the that eighth? was an article I did for the Daily Mail. Abgar the Eighth? Yeah, that, no, that's a later um, Abgar, of course. Um, okay. But uh, they all wore the same regalia. Uh, ever since the first century, all the way up until the third century, they all wore the same regalia. Uh, and what they're wearing, of course, is a crown of thorns. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, uh, this is actually sure. my coin, actually. This is a, a coin that I've got. Uh, on that link from the Daily Mail. <clears throat> and of course, it's not the crown of thorns that you will tend to think, because of course, we, we're, we're, we're so reliant on the um imagery on the interpretations of the clergy of the priesthood and of course they've given us this idea that it's a it's a crown of brambles and of course it's not a crown of brambles this is a proper pope's mitre if you look at some of the early pope's mitres they had lots of things sticking out the top of them and they were these you know big domed crowns that they used to wear mm. yes. um but this one has what you can only really call spines on it or thorns and we don't know what those thorns are why should it have thorns like that um i've, I've got a, a slight feeling they might actually be feathers and not thorns hmm. because they might be the feathers of the um of the phoenix Ooh. because R ralph i've got a, i've got a theory i'd love to offer up to you mm. 
It's a very elaborate theory, but I'll just deliver it as concisely as I can. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that these royal families have a birthright of kings that involves the transmission of the placenta and that the mother consumes the placenta and it becomes uh, the full estate of the family lineage is conveyed onto the child when the child drinks the breast milk of the mother. And there, there is a instilled a knowing, a wisdom, a connection. You can even see this, uh, you see the strings tied in the back of the of the headgear? Those, yeah, that would that's... Be, um, that would be the, the umbilical diadema. cord. <clears throat> okay. Well, I, I don't know what it's symbolic of, but this is a okay. diadema, and this, this comes out of uh, Greece with the, the first people who uh, used to wear these diadema headbands. Yes. Um, and these were rather special because these were made of silk. So you can imagine these were hugely expensive because this silk had to come from China. So back in these, these days, they were trading with um, China in order to get these silk headbands. And you'll see many of the uh, Greek uh, kings and most of the Parthian kings, which is another reason why you know this king came out of Parthia. The Parthian kings always wore a diadema headband which was made of silk. And it must have been probably very colorful as well, I'd imagine. Um, and it was signified the royalty. So not anyone could wear these. This was a, a symbol of royalty. And that's what he's wearing here. You know, uh, another... You'll see it on the king of a playing cards. If you see uh, a king on a standard pack of playing cards, the king is wearing a diadema. Exactly that... the same. Is that where the term dime comes from? Because they, they always have a, a diadem wearing a king on a dime. Uh, it comes from a diadem, yes, um, being a crown. But nowadays we think of that as a metal crown. But, you know, in those days it was a, it was a silk crown. Um, and, you know, that's what he's wearing. So this is very, very Parthian, this this domed crown and the di diadema headband. What is this little Merkabah eight-pointed star here uh, to his left of his head? Uh, yeah, well, that's back of his skull. yeah, that's uh, that's indicating the sun. So this is a solar symbol, because it, all it, of these um, kings were the sons, as it were, of God, and that works in the Greek as much as it does in the English as well. So they were uh, linked to the solar deity. They were the the sun, and the queen was the moon. And we have that. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't share because I've got some images of this. If you look at the um, uh, the zodiac from, uh, there you go. You're sharing. Oh, now now it's sharing. So is he's, that is he, that sharing now? Yep. He's initiated. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they. <laughs> Because I don't know if you know, but the uh, the primary symbol of Judaism was the zodiac, and so we get zodiacs like the famous one on the Sea of Galilee at um, uh, at Hamat Tavera. Uh, I'm just looking for another image here, um, and it's a standard Greek, well, standard zodiac that we would know to, today. So uh, the, the zodiac, um, it's, on, it's in a synagogue on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, just below uh, Tiberias. And it's a standard uh, zodiac. It's quite large. It's about five meters across. Um, and I think they used to use it as a dining table, actually. Uh, and in the center, it's got Helios, the sun god, with his chariot and four horses. And Helios was the sun surrounded by his 12 constellations of the zodiac. Um, and of course, what we have in that imagery is Jesus surrounded by his 12 disciples. Um, it's a standard uh, piece, piece of imagery. Um, I'm just looking for some images of this. Um, so let me have a, a quick look. Uh, astrotheology. Yeah, this one. So if I do this one and open this, and hopefully we'll be able to share it. Um, okay. 
So if I Where do I want to go to? I want to go down to here. So if I stop that share uh, and then go back to share and try and open that one, let's see if it will open that one. There it is. Ah, is that coming up? Because I can't actually see what I'm sharing with you, but you can see that, can you? Yeah, we can see it. I'm wondering, this kind of, uh, I'm wondering right off the bat, I'm wondering if there was ever any snake skin diadems i'm not that i've heard of i don't know um not sure if there ever was um but this is the uh, zodiac uh this is a jewish zodiac on the shores of the sea of galilee and this wow. zodiac was yes yeah, it's, it's a it's a pretty good zodiac actually isn't it that's yeah beautiful. that's beautiful and fantastic that, that uh, this, this archetypal zodiac right was owned by Jesus, <laughs> G Jesus of Gamala. And Jesus of Gamala was the uh, rebel leader of 600 rebel fishermen. Mm. Now, who was the leader of rebel fishermen in the first century? Anyway, this guy, who I have identified with a biblical Jesus for many reasons, he owned this particular uh, zodiac. Um, and the interesting thing about this, well, apart from it, it, it has idolatrous images of animals, which you're not allowed to have within standard Judaism. It okay. shows you how uh, different this Judaism was to what we know as Judaism today. And, and on the top of this, you can't see it, but on the top, the register on top has the Temple of Jerusalem, um, the Ark of the Covenant and the you know, the shofar and the menorah, all of the symbols of Judaism are on the top of this. So we know it's Jewish and it's in a synagogue. But the interesting thing is, is in the center, you see here, this is uh, Helios. And he's holding a blue spherical earth in his gravitational grasp. Right. And you can see it's a sphere because the lines of latitude and longitude are curved, which they would be on a sphere, of course. So uh -huh. this is the sun holding the earth in its gravitational grasp. Mm. So right. they knew the heliocentric model of the universe, of the solar system in this mm -hmm. era. And this is first century. Um, um, we know it's first century because uh, the, head of, um, the head of Helios is pointing at the join between Taurus and Pisces. Sorry, Aries oh, and wow. Pisces. Okay. So this is procession. I presume you're viewers will know about procession, procession yes equinox. yeah well the uh the the great month of aries turned into the great month of pisces in ad 10 so we can date this you know processionally that's why jesus was born as a lamb of god but kept, became a fisher of men he went from aries to torah to to pisces um and therefore we can date this time to the beginning of the first century and we can date this zodiac to the beginning of the first century as well. So this is a surprising aspect of Judaism, is that the central uh, component of this Judaism, Nazarene Judaism, was the zodiac, which you don't see in modern Christianity, and you don't see it in modern Judaism. But this, mm -hmm. And it's so contentious that when I was there, uh, this was about ooh, 10 years ago I was there last, um, there was a party of Orthodox Jews came out of Jerusalem with pickaxes to hack this um, this mosaic up. And luckily they were caught in the act and they stopped them and the damage was was actually repaired. But it's that's how contentious it is, even to this day. Um, because Josephus Flavius, Judaism's greatest historian did exactly the same back in the first century. He was sent by the Jerusalem authorities to destroy this zodiac because it contained the idolatrous images of animals on it. So for 2000 years, people have been trying to destroy this zodiac. Um, yeah, that's how contentious it is. Uh, it looks have... like what... DNA. Good call. Oh, what all of the, uh, yeah, the, the helix, yeah, he's got all these helixes. I do wonder if they knew about that, you know. Um, yes, they did. 
<laughs> well, I've got no evidence that they did, but it, I've got sneaking suspicion they might have done. Um, well, the whole yeah. thing looks like an ocular or looks like a, you know, a version of like a, a viewing scope or like something mm. to gaze with, like, you know, like a like a window a or, you know, like a bigger eye. Yeah. Well, it's certainly like the rose windows that they use, obviously, in, in Catholic churches and mm. so on. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very similar to that. I had a question for um, you. But the interesting... Well, the other interesting one is this one. Um, this is from a Cath uh, Catholic. No, you couldn't call it Catholic. This oh. is from a Christian monastery, again mm. on the Sea of Galilee. So this is the Betxian, uh Zodiac. And notice but, here that because it's in a Christian monastery, they've had to change the symbols of the Zodiac into months. So you can probably read it in the Greek on the, um, uh, in the sort of nine o'clock position. We've got Aprilos. And then below that, we've got May, Mayos, and then uni, Unios. So it's the months uh, of the year as men. Right. We've got 12 men. Apostles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And in the center, of course, we've got the sun and the moon, who are Jesus and Mary Magdalene, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As the king and the queen, who are dressed as the sun and the moon. Um. And so it was widely known in this early era that this is who they were. They were representative of the sun and the moon gods. Um, that was their role within society. And of course, we still have this even now. You know, we have um, Yay! Snow White and some dwarfs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So who was this? Again, this is part of the same story, but we wouldn't know it. This is how you can uh, hide things in plain sight. You don't have to hide it. You hide it in plain sight where everybody can see it. So what's the story of Snow White? Um, well, I think um, Snow White is the Snow White moon. She hmm. is Snow White in the heavens above. And the Wicked Witch is, is, is this, uh, which is the Milky mm -hmm. Way. No. She wasn't as bright as the moon. She was jealous. And the Milky Way, if you know your Egyptian theology, the Milky Way is Newt. This is Newt, who arched her body across the heavens. Mm -hmm. um, so Newt is, is the Milky Way. But in Snow White, we have the Snow White moon, who is followed by the seven, seven dwarf planets, mm. who follow each other in a long line along the ecliptic. If you look at them, they follow each other in a big, long line just as the dwarves do. Mm. Um, but the Wicked Witch gave Snow White a corset and she drew the corset tighter and tighter to make her thinner and thinner and thinner, which of course is exactly waning what the waxing. Um, waning moon does. It gets mm. thinner and thinner and thinner until it dies. The moon dies. When it becomes the new moon, it is dead. You can't see it. But the new moon can kiss the sun, the sun prince, the, the, the prince that comes to see Snow White. And of course, that can only happen at a new moon when you get an eclipse, a solar eclipse, where the moon kisses the sun mm. and you get a consummation in the heavens above, a cosmic consummation of the sun and the moon goddess. And of course, the sun and the moon are exactly the same size in the night sky. Exactly. So you end up with this diamond ring, they call it, the cosmic ring, mm. uh, which is the consummation of these cosmic bodies. And then, of course, the moon comes back to life again. She gets fatter and fatter and fatter, as if she is pregnant. Um, I have a quick it question is a story of the cosmos. Mm. Uh, I was talking on a podcast the other day to uh, a, a Christian. Uh, his name's Nomad. Uh, he was asking uh, about the halo, and you showed that picture of Jesus holding the earth and uh, the, like the image of the sun behind his head. Is the halo the representation of the sun, or is it like a representation of enlightenment? Do you know? Uh, mm. The halo is is an image of the sun. Obviously, it's it's a it's a solar imagery. Mm -hmm. um all of these monarchs in many different locations identified themselves with the heavenly bodies above and quite traditionally the the, the sun was male 
and the the moon was female, which is where we get this imagery from. The only place that didn't occur was in Parthia, which was really confusing, um, where uh, the moon was male. Yeah, and that was very very confusing for the Edessans because they were sort of uh, the conjunction between Greece and Parthia and Rome, and so the Edessans, when they made their imagery in Palmyra which is just below, it's, it's in the Syrian desert, the famous city of Palmyra, which ISIS went and destroyed. I was very upset with them um, <laughs> uh, a few years ago. They destroyed Palmyra. Um, but in Palmyra, they had to display these gods, which was very difficult because they couldn't, you know, they couldn't sex them. So what the Palmyrans did is they made these and androgynous gods for the sun and the moon that you can't tell if it's male or female there we go in order to bridge mm -hmm. the gap between the two so they were they were trans basically <laughs> well that's yes. the that's the that's the ancient hermetic secrets anyway that's underlying most of these ancient beliefs and religions like the true secrecy behind it all is that uh <laughs> you know the hermetic marriage there the alchemical marriage between the sun and the moon right changing yeah. your dna yeah, it was, um, they, they revered, they were Sabean, basically. They were astronomer priests. And so they looked to the stars and to the heavens and to the cosmos and to the um, uh, to, to astrology in order to determine the future. Um, that was very common in all of these religions. That's what Joseph was doing in the Old Testament when he became a fortune teller to the Pharaoh he was obviously an astrologer priest and he was making predictions based on astrology. And didn't uh, the Norse is... worship the sun as a female deity? I don't know, actually. Yeah. The, they might've done the Persians did that. I don't know my Norse theology. Oh, the Persians did that as well. Okay. Yeah. It's closer to home. I think, um, I think it's interesting. The red contrasting on the white here. Uh, do you know what the H on their robes is about? We don't know. This is a mystery still to be solved. It has a name, and this has been observed on several images, not just from Judea, but also from Greece, where they have these uh, symbols, and they're not letters of the alphabet, because, of course, they spoke Aramaic, and there is no H in Aramaic, so it's a symbol, and we don't know what that symbol means. Lots of people have been looking at that, um, but they no, like those to any stones, conclusion. like those eight shaped stones that are stacked uh, in South America. There's like yes. these big eight stones. I forget what culture did that. If the, you there are mind. several. Um, they do the same in um, Gobekli Tepe as well. If you've seen the stones there, they've got lots of yeah. H's on them as well. But we don't know what they mean either. <laughs> well, the, hmm. they, we were talking about the helix earlier. So yeah. there's that. You know that yeah the h yeah but they didn't have the greek alphabet they had the aramaic one i was wondering if it was an image of orion because if you imagine orion it could be sort of h shapeish no mm. we don't i think you're on to something there and yeah the it was obviously important to them because they've all got it but um we right. don't... the, the yeah. reason i was showing this is because this mosaic i think um is an early image of Jesus, a very early image of Jesus as a king of Edessa. So what is this imagery? Now, I knew what this imagery was because this is the guy on the front of my book, Jesus, King of Edessa. You will see he's exactly dressed exactly the same with the same ginger hair. Um, now, I did this um, because I knew that Jesus was a king of Edessa, so I drew this guy on the jacket of my book that's jesus um jesus king of edessa and i did that four years before this mosaic was discovered so this is what i like about my work is it becomes predictive is actually um showing us what can be discovered out there so four years later this mosaic is discovered and i knew exactly what this is displaying because i'd already written about it and the chief archaeologist, who was uh, Jody Magnus, uh, who comes from America, I think she's American, but she's been working in Judea for many, many years. And she had a whole team of Judaic scholars and archaeologists and whatever working on this. And she said that this was Alexander the Great. And I'm thinking, what on earth 
are you talking about, lady? <laughs> um, because, um, well, Alexander never had um, never had a beard. He was always clean shaven. He was never shown to be giving a sacrificial calf to the high priest. The high priest is the um, uh, the guy in the white on the left. Uh, his army was never destroyed. You can't see it here, but underneath this, the, the, there is another register underneath this showing that this army that you can see on the right hand side was destroyed and defeated and all the elephants are on their back, you know, with their legs in the air, all that sort of stuff. Um, so Alexander was never defeated and Alexander never had a Jewish pyot. I don't know if you can see on his uh, left side of his head there, he's wearing a Jewish curly side lock of hair. This is not Alexander the Great. Um, and sadly, I think the reason why she said this is because they sold this imagery to National Geographic. The National Geographic wanted a dramatic headline. Mosaic of Alexander the Great discovered in Judea, because this is in Judea, this is in um, just uh, northwest of um, uh, Sea of Galilee at Hokok, they call it. And I think this imagery was sold on that basis to National Geographic so they could have a, a grand headline. Not because of any evidence, not because of the archaeology, not because of the history of this region. Yeah. Uh, which means this is archaeology for sale, which I really dislike. This is almost as bad as Zahi Hawass in, in Egypt. You know? yeah. <laughs> um, what this is, is a famous, um, well, I thought it was famous, <laughs> story from the Talmud, from the Jewish Talmud. This is Bar Kamsa. And Bar Kamsa in the Talmud is the leader of the Jewish revolt. We're coming back to the Jewish revolt era again. He is the leader of the Jewish revolt. And he started the Jewish revolt by giving a sacrificial calf from Emperor Nero to the high priest of Jerusalem. This is what this is showing, quite obviously. Um, and in order to, it, it, it was a heathen cow anyway, or calf, they actually say. Um, but to make sure that it would be rejected, he cut his lip and you can see the cut on the, on the calf's lip. Uh, this is the same story and he wanted it to be rejected. So he offered this, sacrificial calf from Emperor Nero to the high priest, hoping that it would be rejected. Because that would upset Nero, and it would send the Jews against the Romans, and therefore he could therefore, on the back of this dispute, he could use the Jews as a part of his army in order to take over Rome. Wow, that's so that a was cool the whole read. idea. That's a very cool read. Yeah, well, that's what it says in the Talmud. That's, that was the right. whole point of this. Um, and it says in the Talmud, because of this event, because the high priest, uh, Akulus, I think it was, did reject the calf to upset Nero. And it says, because of this, our temple was destroyed and we were scattered uh, throughout the Roman Empire into exile, uh, which is exactly what happened. So they are blaming, the Talmud is blaming this guy, Bar Kamsa, um for the jewish revolt and of course they call him bar Kamza because they're not allowed to call him jesus they're not allowed to call him Jesus, the king of edessa because those names were forbidden they call him bar Kamza because it means the locust again wow. he's being the locust Kamza means locust in aramaic and of course you can he is a king of Edessa. So you can see on his head, he's wearing the diadema headband that we've been talking about with the tassels on the back. That is the silk uh, headband. He's wearing a um, Jewish payot, the uh, side lock of hair, because these were Nazarene Jews. The Edessans were Nazarene Jews. Um, he's wearing the purple cloak. If you remember, Jesus was uh, crucified while wearing the purple cloak. That's indicative of what this was all about, because the purple cloak was the symbol of the emperor of Rome. Why did they dress Jesus in a purple cloak? It's because the revolt he was involved in was a bid for the throne of Rome. He wanted to become the next emperor of Rome. 
right had nothing to do really with with Judea this little dispute this was all about him becoming the next emperor of Rome because remember Nero was dead only just after this in AD 68 Nero was dead the throne of Rome was empty for whoever could grab it and four emperors came and went in one year with people trying to grab this particular throne of Rome and right. this I think was the fifth guy. This was the fifth emperor of Rome. And he threw his hat into the ring, as it were, um, by engineering this dispute with the Jews over in the east of the empire in order to use this as a springboard with which to take over Rome. Because they had enough, they had an army, which was quite an effective army. They had enough money. These were the richest people uh, in Judea. Um, not in Judea, in the whole of the Near East. These were the richest people in the Near East. So they had tons of money to purchase an army and use that as being the king of Syria and Judea, which is a very powerful location in the uh, Roman Empire. Syria used to be the richest um, province in the Roman Empire mm -hmm. in, as a springboard to take over the throne of Rome. And wow. remember that this battle ended up between this guy, who we can now identify as King Isis Manu um, of Edessa. And also, if you look at his legs, he's wearing stockings. The Edessans wore stockings. Mm. Um, it was just a, it was a Parthian habit. Again, so we know where this guy came from. Um, Superheroes. But uh, this guy ended up fighting against Vespasian. So we ended up with this right royal battle in Judea between this guy as the leader of the Edessan stroke Judean army uh, against, um, uh, against Vespasian, Commander Vespasian. And whoever won this battle was going to sail to Rome as the next emperor. Mm. And of course, this guy lost. That's why on the bottom register, his army is all defeated. It was Vespasian who won this battle, and it was Vespasian who sailed to Rome as the next emperor of Rome. Hmm. That's what this battle was all about. It was a battle hmm. for the throne of Rome, which was empty at this time. Whoever won this battle was going to become emperor. And this guy, the Jesus guy, lost. That's why this was such an important story. And everyone knew about this story. This is why this story had to be covered up, because this guy very nearly became the next emperor. That's why he's wearing the purple cloak, the right. symbol of the emperor. You know, there's there's a there's a peculiar shape, that epsilon shape in his robe down at the bottom, that the E shape. Yeah. That is that is very much the shape of Cassiopeia, uh, who is rumored to be uh, Ethiopian queen in her in her legacy and she's oh, yes. married so she would be the empress card in the tarot and the emperor card is her husband and this guy is dressed like most of the emperor cards his entire getup looks like the emperor card from most of the tarot decks uh so it's just fascinating that it has that cassiopeia epsilon shape embedded into his it's also three steps well, there could be a lot of symbolism in this. We don't know. I mean, this was yeah, this was the standard um, um, armor of these monarchs. So we have images of these um, Edessan monarchs, and yeah. they all wear this this sort of getup. Yeah, this sort yeah. of standard sort of Roman uh, military uniform. Yes. Um, so this was fairly standard in this this uh, era. His yeah. breastplate looks like a sun. It even has like the little rays coming out the bottom and it's red. Oh, yeah. right. Right. And yeah. his elbow as well. In yeah. the, the fella in white. So if he's the, uh, so the emperor, he's always in the uh, spring, the spring equinox. The opposition of him, 180 degrees on the zodiac, is the Bootes constellation, is Virgo, is usually depicted at wearing white. And uh, Buotes, the constellation in Virgo, has one arm lifted, just like this fellow with his one arm pointing to the sky. And the fellow who's pointing his finger into his armpit is um, kind of reenacting the um, Thomas, the Doubting Thomas 
putting the finger into the hole of the ribs of Christ. All of that <laughs> yes. is anatomically well, this, perfect. This for symbolism of the single finger, of course, is the symbol of Isis, if ah, you remember. Nice. They use the single finger. Yes. Uh, what you didn't have to tell them, because they get very angry if you do, is they were copying the high priest of Jerusalem, <laughs> the Jewish high priest. Uh, yeah, cool. they wouldn't appreciate that. But it's the same symbol. They've been using the same symbol for God. It's supposed to be the symbol of the one and only God. They put up one finger. Um, but of course, that God was not Allah. He was not the Muslim Allah. His name was El, Elohim, or Allah, Ella which is the Jewish name for God. It's not the Arabic. The Arabics just copied them, of course. Um, they're they're awesome. using the same God figure and the same name. Now, what That's about great. Yahweh? H could be Hashem, which is short for Yahweh, because they didn't like to say the full name. So, yeah, uh, well, we Yahweh, um, Yahweh comes from the Egyptian. You see, I say all of these people came out of Egypt. We've already talked about Cleopatra. Um, the Israelites came out of Egypt as well because Josephus Flavius says that the Israelites were the Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt. And we can go into that if you want, because that's another interesting oh. story. Um, so this story came out of Egypt and Yahweh comes from the Egyptian Yah, which means the moon, the moon god. So the moon in Egypt, e Egypt was known as Yah. And it's quite obvious that they were using Yahweh as the moon god. They were using El Elohim um, as the sun god because that turned into mm. the Greek Helios, Elios, came from Elohim, um, which is the sun god. And so we've got the sun and the moon. We've got Elohim and Yahweh are the sun and the moon. And then right. the other god name um, for the Jews is Adon. So the god of the Jews is known as the Adon. Yes. And the Ardon is the god of Pharaoh Akhenaten. So Akhenaten, Akhenaten he, the god of Akhenaten was known as the Aton or the Ardon. It's the same god name that the uh, Israelites were using. So all of this came out of Egypt. I'm, I'm pretty, yeah. pretty sure. If, if, we could, like so, if we could get into, because uh, we covered Mary. So Mary is Thea Musa, granddaughter of Cleopatra and julius caesar and so now we have the virgin mary set and then jesus is the product of virgin mary and and who and god is there immaculate conception here or I, is, can we get into uh joseph well all of um all of the pharaohs of egypt were the son of god mm -hmm. so this is the standard title of all of the kings no. Um, they were sons of the God that didn't negate any um, uh, normal human sexual relations. Of course, it was just their formal title. They were all sons of God. You know, they were Ra Moses, Ar Moses, Tuth Moses. They were Tuth the Moses. son of Thoth, the son of Ra, etc. Mm -hmm. um, these were just copying the same old age old tradition. And that's why he's known as the son of God. Um, uh Across any assertions about Elohim being plural for a henotheistic pantheon of gods? Mm. But that could that perhaps yeah, Elohim is, is plurals, which is always interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um for, for a monotheistic uh, religion. But of course, it's never been monotheistic. If you look at Kings David and Solomon, uh, they were raising temples to many of the gods. Mm -hmm. So David and Solomon were polytheistic. If you read the book of Jeremiah, uh, the mad prophet uh, Jeremiah, uh, he, uh, his people, because they had a second exodus out of uh, Jerusalem, some of them were taken into bondage in, in uh, Babylon, but Jeremiah went south into Egypt, and his people were worshipping the Queen of Heaven. And the Queen of Heaven is obviously Isis. And uh, he's ranting and raving at them. This is why he's known as the Mad Prophet, um, shouting at them, you know, you've got to be monotheistic. And they're saying, no, when we used to um, uh, venerate the Queen of Heaven, everything was good. When we stopped, we ended up exiled from our lands. So don't tell us, you know, not to venerate ISIS, basically. Um, um, so the Jews of this era were, were most definitely polytheistic. That's interesting that the uh, an anagram for the word mono is moon, 
and like the ancient worship of the moon for like matriarchal types of <clears> cultures, <throat> uh, more pagan cultures was never mono. It was like, there was always that triple phase kind of ideology of the moon worship, you know, because they had yeah. the, the fall in the but, dark. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But but yes. remember that the, the language they were speaking was not English. So you, you can't do that translation on it. Um, uh, mono is uh, from the Greek, of course, uh, and it means only, which is why Jesus was known as the only king. Um, so because the kings of Adiabeni, which I say is Odessa, of course, um, were known as Monobazus. And I don't know why historians can't understand what this name means. They say, oh, it's the name of the king. No, it's not the name of the king. Monobazus means the only king. Mm. Mono meaning the only one. And Bazus from Basilus, which means king in Greek. So it's meaning the only king, which is exactly what Jesus was called. He was known as the only king. Um, in in uh, Aramaic, a moon is a uh, yerach. So you'd have to do a, um, a comparison with Yerak. Uh, and then if you go into the Greek, it's uh, Selene, which is why we get mm -hmm. Cleopatra. Selene was known as, uh, because the sons of Queen Cleopatra from Mark Antony were Selene and Helios, girl and boy. I, I'm, I'm not sure if they were twins. They might've been twins, I don't know. But anyway, her sons, uh, her, her children, were Helios and Selene, the sun and the moon. So again, we, we have this evocation of, of the solar bodies in the names of her children. Um, right. So and, the, I want... the, and the sun and the moon are twins because they're almost mm -hmm. exactly the same size. Yeah. With a negligible difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, totally the same size. And of course, when, they, when you get a, um, a solar eclipse, they are, you know, almost identical in the night sky they cover each other yep. up um, well, and the and the worship or like the you know the motif surrounding eclipse to our ancestors was so much more potent and important uh spiritually than it is now in modern society which is kind of uh sad because you know it's happening subconsciously there's this like energetic effects that happen upon here that people don't really realize are happening or affecting their lives and in, in ancient days it would, they would be waiting for the eclipse the mm -hmm. marriage of their you know of the the sky gods to come together and then they would hold ceremony and have other very important ritualistic things just always like to just you know throw that out there that you know <laughs> we're not, you, we live you should on the write same a book planet. about that roman <clears throat> the different like uh ways that they would celebrate uh you know, eclipses throughout history. Oh, yes. Uh, I'll get right on that. Um, you would love it. <laughs> uh, hey, Ralph, before I actually have to uh, go not too uh, uh, shortly from now, and I really wanted to ask you this question for a while. I wanted to ask you your opinion on the founding of Rome and that symbolic story of the wolf, um, the, 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 the she-wolf, uh, the mother found of Romulus and Remus. And... Mm. Um, and ask you just like what your what your opinion is on that through your study and your research. We've had a couple guests on here to tell us some things. And, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, obviously the boundaries between countries have been so scrambled throughout time that you have to just look at ancient maps to even get an idea of where places were and, uh, and where they are now. Um, but uh, <clears throat> some some fringe circles say that you know the the romanov family or like a branch of uh, russians came down and and took that over for some ancient you know feud or something and i'm just curious what is what is your opinion on the she wolf story founding of rome uh, to be honest i don't know um because i i tend to link things back into egypt because this is where a lot of this uh, theology and history came from and i can't see a mm comparison there in in egyptian legends so I've i don't got, know really where they got that one from that i've got, um, I've got to weave on that yeah the, uh, the wolf constellation is lupus it's essentially in libra uh maybe a little earlier and nine months later you end up in gemini so the wolf uh -huh. the gives twins. nine months of birth and the twins pop out 
of the wolf. I mean, Osiris uh, was uh, symbolized with a wolf head, right? If I'm not mistaken, in ancient, uh, what was the? T- yes, a lion's head. <clears throat> yeah, I think the wolf would have been Anubis. Well, it mm-hmm. depends on oh. what source you're looking at, because in the Quran it talks about she wolves um like nine she wolves and she goats and stuff like that but depending on what you're looking at and who's doing the talking i think right and the other thing about anubis being the wolf it seems like a stretch because he's a jackal and wolf is not a jackal but anubis holds the scales and the wolf is in the constellation with the scales so it seems like a jump at first but when you bring the other artifacts of the zodiac into play the wolf plays mm. the role of Anubis because you're going into the underworld in the fall in Libra. You're going into the darkness. So you're entering the realm Weighing of death. the souls. Like like a like a polis is the town of, uh in ancient Egypt that was represented with Osiris as a wolf head. And what I was reading on that doing that werewolf kind of research back in the day where the like the etymology of uh lycanthropy came from from man to wolf. Uh and so like like a polis that's where i kind of got the osiris thing right. from. uh but that with the libra connection and the gemini twins is nuts uh that's cool yeah i, I don't know if you can see this image that i've got here on the screen has that come up a mm-hmm. big mound yeah yeah um i was just going back to something we've been talking about this is the uh, tomb of uh, Queen Cleopatra Selene, the daughter of mm. Cleopatra. Uh, so this is the one in North Africa in Libya, um, and it's quite large. And of it's course, they've got they. Uh, yeah, well, it's all made of stone, of course. So it's not just an earth mound, but it's circular mm. with this um, conical shape on the top. And we can go into the um, history of the conical stone if you want in a, in a minute, because that's quite interesting. Um, and not many people visit this, of course, because it's been so dangerous. And this is um, the comparison between Cleopatra. You know, I was saying uh, Thea Musa was the daughter of Cleopatra. Well, these are their two busts. So on the right, we have Queen Thea Musa Aurania of uh, Parthia, uh, who I say was the daughter of Cleopatra, who's on the left. Mm. And I see a family relationship there a little bit. They look rather similar to me. That's one yeah. of the reasons why I think that Thea Musa was a daughter. They're made of alabaster. Of the same, they got the same nose. Yeah. Um, and, and the same sort of receding chin as well. Um, a sort of weak receding chin a little bit. The Habsburgian chin. <laughs> and these are the um, three magi which came to see Jesus. And of course, they were the... Um, the priests and the kingmakers of Parthia. And you've got to wonder why on earth were the priests of Parthia in, 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 interested in this uh, supposedly Jewish birth in, in Judea? Well, if he was a, um, a prince of Parthia, which I think he was, then that's a good reason for them coming. And you can see they're all wearing the Phrygian cap. A lot of this mm. symbology has lasted down down the centuries. We still have this symbology. I don't know if you recognize this, but this Phrygian cap is supposed to be the cap of uh, freedom. Uh, I'm Bag not entirely hat. sure where it comes from, but it's it's now the um, symbol of France. So this is the um, Marianne, who's mm. the uh, primary symbol of France. And quite obviously, she's Mary Magdalene, hence the yeah. name Marianne. Mm-hmm. And she's wearing the Phrygian cap. And here, the Phrygian cap looks a little bit like the um, uh, Nemean lion, which you yeah. see Hercules wearing. I don't know if that's yeah. where it comes from, because I really don't know what the Phrygian cap sort of means. Ooh. I, think, I think it relates to, uh, to uh, being initiated, uh, mm-hmm. probably a psychedelic mushroom initiation. Alchemists uh, would commonly wear Phrygian caps as well. Yeah, well, here, here they are. Here's the, here's the ladies in France wearing the um, Phrygian cap. These are all dressed as Marianne, of course. Mm. Um, so this is still very popular in France today. And then this um, went to the Smurfs. Yeah, <laughs> I was thinking that too, the Smurfs. Who also wear the Phrygian 
cap. So this symbology has lasted. I'm sure someone must know. Exactly it looks Egyptian. Well, I don't know. I haven't really seen anything quite like that in Santa in Claus. Egypt. And, and yeah. only the only the alpha patriarch gets the red cap. Well, it's like upper and lower <laughs> yes. Egypt. Papa or... Smurf. And this one's interesting because if we go back into um, New Testament times, of course, mm. we have all of these miracles. But of course, they weren't miracles at all. Uh, one of the miracles was turning water into wine. But this was a well-known trick in the first century. So uh, these trick jugs were made by Hieron of Alexandria, who mm -hmm. was the sort of Leonardo da Vinci of the first century. Um, he was known as the Mechanicos, the machine man. He made all sorts of things from water pumps, jet turbines, birds that sang, all sorts of things he was making in the first century. But one of the things he liked making more than anything Musical else... Musical instruments was, as well. Yeah, he did all, yeah, all that sort of stuff, yeah. Uh, but one of the things he liked making was these trick jugs that would turn water into wine. Now, this is a well-known trick from the first century, and nobody within the church will tell you where this trick comes from. And, and this is the original drawings. We still have them um, from this era, from the first century, explaining how it works. So there's obviously two compartments, and you can separate the water and the wine. And K up the top here, you can see K is a little hole. That's a little air hole. And depending on whether you put your finger over that hole, you'll either get... Um, water or you get wine. It, it works on uh, water surface tension and um, uh, siphonic action, all this sort of stuff. Uh, so it's quite a clever little device, but this is a well-known party trick for the aristocracy, for the monarchies to amaze their guests at their weddings, perhaps, at their weddings at Cana. And this is exactly what Jesus was doing. It was Jesus who was doing this at his own wedding, at the wedding of Cana, when he got married to Mary Magdalene. These were well-known first century tricks. And yet, of course, it's repeated in the Bible and it's repeated by the clergy as being an absolute miracle. Nothing to do with miracles. It was a well-known trick. Same right. as this one. Um, <clears throat> this is known as a um, uh, camera obscura. Um, and of course, we get the story of uh, Simon Magus, uh, who was able to conjure uh, a little boy in from nothing. But this boy didn't really exist. He was a real boy, but you couldn't touch him. He was ethereal. And how was this done? Well, it was a camera obscura, of course. And a camera obscura, as you can see in this uh, little diagram, is a big box with a hole in the wall. Um, and it will project, if you get a light enough, bright enough image outside of something, it will project that image onto the back wall of the room. That's why it's called a camera obscura, from the Latin, camera obscura, a, uh, a dark room. Um, and so you stand in the room and you can see, and if, if okay, they've got an image of a, a castle or something, <clears throat> but if you had a little boy standing outside, then an image of that little boy would be cast onto the wall. And I don't know if you've seen a camera obscura, but the image you get is television quality. So you imagine yourself being in the first century and you can see a television or a cinema quality image of a boy sitting on the back wall. You yes. would be totally amazed by it. I mean, he's a real boy. You can say, you know, lift your arm and he'll lift his arm. You know, right. um, turn your head and he'll turn his head. It's a real image of a real boy, but he's not there. You can't touch him. All, all you get if you try and touch him is you, you touch the wall instead. Wouldn't he be upside down? He would be upside down. So if they wanted to do this properly, they'd have to hang the poor boy from <laughs> his feet in order to make him the right way up. But yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Apart from that, it works fine. And of course, it would amaze all of your guests, you know, who would have no idea how you've uh, performed this trick. It's a miracle. No, right, no, right. Ralph, I loved this article. I, I, I read the article that you uh, wrote about uh, Hero of Alexandria, and it sent me down to quite a long <laughs> slew of revelations uh, for myself. It was really enjoyable. You know, uh, 
I have a theory that Hero of Alexandria might be immortalized as a constellation. Uh, oh, okay. Because I, yep. well, for one, I think that the the camera obscura technique would be a fascinating um, revelation of the method for uh, the Daniel Five, where Nebuchadnezzar sees a disembodied hand writing messages on the wall. Wouldn't it be nifty if there was a priest class pulling strings with the camera obscura to convey that message? That's that's just a theory. That came to me when I was reading your article, but also dang good one. I think yeah. it's, it's there might be a there there, but Hero of Alexandria. What I also I learned about his steam engine that he invented yes. this, a a form of a steam engine, <laughs> which then brought me to a constellation with a very extreme southern hemisphere, very uh, very low. There is uh, our I think it's called. Uh, our altar it's a it's a it's and it looks just like his steam engine it's an altar under that's hovering above a fire it's on a tripod so it looks so much like his steam engine and then next to that constellation is the indus constellation who today they depict him as a native american fella, feather fellow with a headdress of feathers but he's so close to that steam engine and it really makes sense if you think of the steam engine automatically spinning, generating energy of rotation, because they're right there by the pole. And so psychologically, it generates the uh, a pictographic illusion of movement being generated by that fire down low. And I just think that's really fascinating, because mm. also, they say that when you're cast down into hell, down into the underworld, you're going to be burning forever. Well, sure enough, in the constellations, there is a fire burning in perpetuity that makes the world go round. Hmm. And a penuma. <clears throat> the a air pump. Yeah, I think they called it the aerophile. Um, but yes, that was the steam engine. It was it was actually more like a, a steam turbine, actually. Right. Um, but yeah, that was um, very advanced for that era, of course. Now, have you heard of the story of water being turned into wine? Uh, there was a story of Dr. Christopher, who was popular in the 50s, that said Jesus turned water into wine by pouring a little bit of wine or grape juice into a pitcher and pouring the water over it to purify the water and, and oxidize the water from the uh, impurities. Okay, well, I know they mixed water with wine quite often. That was quite common in Rome. Um, but I think this is a much better explanation of uh, how this trick was done, because this is what they were doing in the first century. So yes, we, the trick is we have the artifact, later, we have the story. Mm. To make it seem like a miracle. Well, of course, they wanted to make this guy very special, and so they translated everything as being a miracle. Um, yeah. <clears throat> that's, you know, how, how you called? elevate your hero. Is it Paul who made those embellishments in the when he wrote the Bible? Well, I think that the um, <clears throat> a lot of the Bible was actually written by Josephus Flavius. Okay. Because I have this uh, theory, um, which goes back a long while now, to 1996, um, that Saul, St. Paul, yeah. was Josephus Flavius. Oh, okay. I like that. Because we have this problem with all of these people being missing from the historical record, and Jesus is one of those people, James is another, but also uh, Saul is missing from the historical record. We don't know who he is, and yet it was Saul who created Christianity. Remember, Christianity doesn't come from the church of Jesus and James. They were Nazarene Jews. Uh, Christianity comes from the simple Judaism of Saul, who was the... Um, uh, the apostle to the Gentiles, he called himself. So he went around um, evangelizing to the Gentiles and getting converts. And um, it was from that simple Judaism, because he didn't have to follow Mosaic law. Uh, he was given four very simple rules by James to convert the, um, uh, the Gentiles into simple Judaists. So they weren't fully Judaic, they were half Judaic. Mm. And that's what became Christianity. Well, um, I know was a Roman soldier initially, right? 
what, Josephus Flavius, yes. Um, well, he was a priest. Well, he must have been a prince because he was very important before that. But yes, he became, um, I think he, he did this evangelism because my chronology is slightly different. He did this evangelism in the AD 50s. So AD 52 up until AD 56 or about there is when he was going across the Mediterranean uh, evangelizing to the, to the Gentiles. And then he got sent to Rome. And remember, Saul and Josephus were both on the same ship going to Rome. So they were both sent as prisoners because the Saul had was um, he had been sort of convicted of teachings that were against Judaism, and he had been thrown into prison. Now, it's very odd that he's in prison. This is another reason we know he's a prince uh, of Edessa more than anything else. Um, he's supposed to be a tent maker. This is Saul. He's supposed to be a tent maker. Yet when he is in prison. He is visited by all of the um, governors of Judea and by the king and queen of Judea, Agrippa II and Berenike. You don't get the king and queen going to a prison to visit a tent maker. They always try to make out these people are paupers. Um, quite obviously, he was very important. And, and one of the governors was looking for bribes to get out of prison from Saul. Uh, you don't go looking for bribes from a tent maker. So it's quite obvious that this guy was quite uh, important and quite wealthy. Um, mm. And the reason why they call him a tent maker, again, it's this play on words. They've mistranslated things. Uh, he wasn't a tent maker. He was a, um, uh, a tabernacle maker. What do they call it? Um, the Feast of Tabernacles. A Levite? Um, well, no, there's a special name for them. I'll remember it in a minute. But <clears throat> during the Feast of the Tabernacles, they all make tents. Oh, uh, and... Sukkot. Is that Sukkot? You're right. There we go. Sukkot. Um, so yeah. he was a Sukkot maker. He was making Sukkot, not just general tents. And it was known at that time that Queen Helena, the, the queen we've been talking about, had the largest Sukkot in the whole of Judea. And so it, it seems just obvious that Saul was the Sukkot maker for Queen Helena, who was the Queen of Edessa. We know that from the Syriac historians. Um, so that explains the, the wealth and the influence of someone like Saul. He was an ambassador of Edessa. We've already seen that with the famine relief money. Now he's making Sukkots, tabernacles, for the queen um, of Edessa. And um, so anyway, he was thrown into prison, and then they couldn't decide what to do with this guy. Um, and so they said, well, we'll send him to Rome. We'll send him to Nero. And you're thinking, hold on a minute. No governor of Judea in his right mind would send a tent maker to go and see the emperor of Rome about some convoluted um, teachings he was giving about Judaism, which the Roman emperor doesn't care about Judaism anyway. So, you know, if 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 a Roman go Roman governor had to send this guy to Rome because of such a stupid thing, um, I think his career would be over <laughs> immediately. Who's that idiot trying to govern Judea, you know? So the guy must have been very important to be sent to the emperor, to be tried in front of the emperor. He must have been very important, <clears throat> which is why I think he was a prince of Edessa. But more importantly than that, I think he got sent to Rome because he had agreed to become a spy, <clears throat> a spy for Rome, yes. because um, I'm going to have to clear my throat, sorry. Um, because this is in, in, all during the run-up to the Jewish revolt. Now, Rome knew something was, was afoot in Judea. They didn't quite know what was going on. They wanted eyes on the ground in Judea. They wanted someone who understood Judaism and the Judaic people. Uh, oh. And I think the person that they chose, because he was already in trouble, uh, I think was Saul, 
who was Josephus Flavius, um, because they both ended up on this prison ship going to Rome. So in AD 62, Saul and Josephus are on this boat being sent across to Rome. The boat was called Castor and Pollux, so they had boat names in those days. And they both got shipwrecked on Malta. So this Whoa. boat, uh, this ship floundered uh, on Mal Malta. And we get this wonderful description of, of, which seems to indicate me to me that this was a real story. We get this uh, first sort of hand description of this boat being dashed into the shore where they had to throw things overboard to lighten the load. They had to um, trail the lifeboat behind them I didn't even know that they had lifeboats in the Roman era. But anyway, they put the lifeboat over the side and trailed it behind the ship on a rope because it was too heavy. Um, and then they heard the breakers up in front. Obviously, the, there's waves somewhere. Uh, and so they put two anchors out of the back of the boat in order to try and slow it down. But it got dashed to pieces on the shore of Malta. Um, and so both of these characters are in this shipwreck and then they get taken to Naples and then they get taken to Rome uh, to go and see Nero. They've got identical lives, these two people. And I think yeah. at that point, uh, I think that Saul, and I'll call him sort of Saul Josephus because I think these two people are linked, uh, became a spy working for Rome at that time. Yeah. Um, because he seems to have been doing that later on during the Jewish revolt. Um, and so this is the guy, I think, that wrote most of this story, because a lot of I this story it. comes from Saul, remember? Saul was the, the guy who wrote most of the New Testament, comes out of the, um, uh, the writings of Saul. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what is written in the New Testament comes from the works of Josephus, Josephus Flavius. Right. This is why they say, if you ever look up in history and say, you know, <clears throat> who, when was the New Testament written? And they always say, oh, well, it was in the AD 70s it was written. So the gospel events all took place in the AD 20s and AD 30, but it wasn't written until 40 years later. And they won't say there was a period of 40 years of oral transmission because they couldn't write, these poor people, you know, they were so right. dumb, they couldn't write. And you think, hold on a minute, Judea was one of the most literate parts of the Roman Empire. Of course they could write. You've only got to look at the works of Josephus Flavius to know how good they were, were recording their history. Right. <clears throat> so why do they say this? They say this because a lot of the quotes and information within the New Testament come from the works of Josephus Flavius. And of course, Josephus didn't write this down until AD 72, minimum. Mm -hmm. So those quotes, all of those elements from Josephus Flavius have to be written in the AD 70s. And so they have to adjust this timeline to make it fit and say, oh, oral transmission for 40 years. I don't think that's true. If these events were the events of the Jewish revolt, and that's why the gospel story was written, um, it was written down immediately after these events happened in the AD 70s. Yeah. And that yeah. is why we have this, this difference in the chronology. Um, but we have a good idea that that is so anyway, because, um, I mean, if you, if you read the Gospels, Jesus talks about Jerusalem being surrounded by a wall and a trench. Mm. Now, that happened during the Jewish revolt. That comes directly from Josephus Flavius. It happened in AD uh, 68, when Jerusalem was surrounded by a wall and a trench. It was made by the Romans. Is, is, this, um, the part, is this the part with the fratricidal pact, where they circle 41 men in a circle and they all killed the brother to their left? Yeah, that was, jo that was Josephus uh, Flavius. But yes, that has uh, implications for this. Josephus was an an awful person. This is why <laughs> nobody can admit to him uh -huh. being Saul or being anything to do with the New Testament because he was a mm -hmm. slimy, egotistical man. There was only one man that mattered right. to Josephus right. Flavius, well, and that was you know, himself. 
So yeah, well, something interesting. <laughs> so I want to, I want to, I want to weave yeah. on the, on this the tent maker awful. really quick. I think that when they say tent maker, that means that he could write up a contract. He was capable <laughs> in, in fabricating a covenant. I think that might be what that's encoding. He's a secretary. He's a secretary. He's a, he's capable of writing. Uh, he's literate enough that he's valuable. But all, and then the forty one the forty one brothers in a circle, that's a fascinating story to me. That um you know they uh, they all agreed to kill the fella to the left, and it went around the circle two times. And Josephus was savvy enough to have done the math in advance. He knew to put himself in seat number nineteen so that he would be the only one standing. And so when he comes out of a forty one man fratricidal pact, he is the soul survivor he's saul. the saul yeah. he's the last one left he becomes saul and, yeah but that, and, that, you're going back into the english again that's not what it means um the well, name saul comes from king saul right the, but from the, the old people testament who, my, but the people who gave us english are giving us the artifact to transcript the lesson of the story so I know it well, Latin to too. It is a lot like English, right? It I know it. I know it wouldn't. The English doesn't fit in the time, but the English people giving us the story are giving us the key to uh, to decipher the story. But so, that, one more thing: when you're the last man of a forty-one person uh, fratricidal agreement, you're absorbing a great deal of energy. You're almost consuming their their life, their karma. You're consuming and taking on their karma, and there's a uh, there's a lot packed into that story. I think more than just the the blood and the gore and the trauma of it. I think there's something very magical about that story as well. Probably celestial. Well, uh, it's, it's possible, but it, what it what it shows to me is is how um, dastardly this guy was. He was quite <laughs> happy that everybody else in the room slaughtered themselves. So for, for people who don't know this story, this was yeah. at the siege of Jotapata. Uh, and he was the army commander in charge of Jotapata, which was being sieged by the Romans. Uh, eventually, the Romans came over the walls uh, and they disappeared down into this cellar. And there was this group of people in the cellar and they were down there for three days. All this this you know, standard symbology. Um, and they couldn't surrender to the Romans. But Saul wanted to, um, sorry, Josephus, we're talking about Josephus here. Josephus wanted to surrender. And they said, don't you dare, we'll kill you. So he said, well, well, why don't we kill ourselves then? You know, <laughs> save the job. Don't let the Romans do it. You know, um, yeah. that's cowardly. Why don't we do it ourselves? That's That's much more manly. And so he arranged this little um, methodology, either by what you were saying there, or there's another version that says that he was choosing who would kill who. Oh, wow. And, Even and so more by sinister. doing so, yeah, so he was the last man standing, of course. So he was happy to see all of his compatriots killed so that he could surrender to Vespasian, who was up above. Uh, and then Vespasian was angry that he had taken so long to come out of this dungeon, which again sort of indicates to me that he had been working as a spy and Vespasian was expecting him to surrender to him because he was already working as a spy for Rome. Um, this was during the Jewish revolt, of course. This was AD 68 or something of that nature. Dead men tell no tales. Yeah. Sorry, I missed that. Is it with the Sicarians, the revolt when they were stuck up on top of that uh, plateau? No, that was AD seventy, uh, AD seventy to seventy three. Um, so the Sicarii, which of course was one of the um, disciples of Jesus, was a Sicarii. Judas Iscariot was a Sicarii. Yes. Uh, they were the dagger men. They were the sort of um, ass assassins. And yeah, after the Jewish revolt and the destruction of, of uh, the Jerusalem and the temple, a load of them managed to escape down to Masada, which was this big fortress down on the shores of the uh, Dead Sea. And they had 900 of them um, sitting on the top of this fortress. It was supposed to be impregnable. And then the Romans started building a ramp all the way up to the top of it. 
it took them three years. I mean, there, it was really was impregnable in this place. Um, but finally, they, they saw that the Romans were getting close. And again, they decided to kill themselves. And so all 900 of them uh, committed suicide. And strangely enough, and, and your listeners might, might like this one, I don't know, but it appears in Star Wars. Um, this is Gabe's realm right I here. I just wonder if I can quickly find an image yeah. of, um, of Jeddah. Oh, my goodness. Can you find it? Um, let, let me just... Uh... I'm just trying to search for some images here. I just have a quick question. When you were talking about Joseph hiding away and uh, they were killing themselves and he gave himself up to Vespasius, were you referring to the story of Joseph in the Genesis and Isaiah being put in a hole and wanting to be killed by his brothers? It has similarities, doesn't it? Um, these yeah. similarities keep uh, cropping up, but no, that is a separate story. Okay. But I think if you looked at it hard, you might find some similarities there because, yeah, it, it does have some similarities, doesn't it? it does. Um, went to the you Pharaoh. never know with these things. They were always copying events in the past. This was part of Pesha. Um, this is what they loved doing is, is copying um events that had happened in the past because that could be used as prophecy uh, um, so i i've just started uh, sharing a screen i don't know if you can see that we've got two hills yes okay uh, ralph okay. how would you how would you spell pesha uh p-e-s-h-e-r pesha oh gotcha. it's a form of prophecy from the talmud thank you and it's a comparison with events in the past because history repeats itself and based mm -hmm. upon that you can use that for prophecy if you can understand what happened in the past you can understand what's going to happen in the future that is that is pesha um, cool. but this is just um i don't know if you can see this we've got two mountains mm -hmm. okay yes. now the bottom one is masada and the top one is Jeddah from, from star wars from star wars where does it now, appear in Star Wars? Is that in Mandalorian? Uh, I forget which um, I forget which episode this is in. Wow! But if if you think yeah, about what Bill Burr. Bill Burr was the sniper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. Wow, I, I got... Ralph, this is amazing. Um, but this uh, is the whole point of Star Wars. Star Wars was this story. If you imagine, what is Star Wars? It's it's a story about the Jedi. Who are the the Judas, Judah. Mm -hmm. who yeah. are monks who roam around the universe in a cloak with a sword, and nothing else, uh -huh. which the Essene <laughs> used to do. The Essene used to go around Judea with a cloak and a staff, or sometimes a sword. Um, and they have a force, an, an invisible force that will protect them. The force will be with you. That was the Judaic God, of course. Um, and then you have the, um, well, you have this, of course, this is the homeland of the, the Jedi. This was their spiritual homeland. And it's exactly the same, which was destroyed by the evil empire. Who's the evil empire? The evil empire is the Roman empire who were trying to destroy these people. The Essene, the Romans oh were trying God. to destroy them. Absolutely. Um, and this was their homeland. And this is where the Essene Sikari went to as you as you said they went to here they went to Masada and here is Masada which is Jeddah uh, which was destroyed by the evil empire just as Masada was destroyed by the evil Romans oh my gosh oh wow. this is um, this and is of so course, much there's so much here uh, <laughs> you, you, so the, you know t they did a census in the UK and today there are more registered Jedi than there yes. are <laughs> than there are Jews Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I did that on the last census. I put myself down as a Jedi as well. Oh, man. <laughs> well played. Well played. Um, I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> well, you, the, there was an other. So you had Christian, Jew, Muslim or whatever, and then you could put down other. And so, you know, you just write in Jedi. And yeah, so it was like... <laughs> 
it was like about 15% of the population ended up as Jedi. Um, <laughs> That's so funny. But but also in this film, we, we have <clears throat> the evil commander of the army who had gone over to the dark side. Now, who was the army commander who had been with the Essenes and been with the Edessans, but went over to the Romans, went over to the dark side? The Josephus? That, that was Josephus. Yeah. <laughs> so Darth Vader is Josephus. Um, oh my gosh. And it's, it, there are so many comparisons to be made. It seems highly likely that Star Wars was a retelling of the Jewish revolt based in the future, based in the galaxy, rather than being in Judea. But the story is the same. What about and of Emperor course, Palpatine? People do this all the time. To preserve a story, they repeat it and, and re recast it into the modern era. Yeah, it's absolutely. like West Side Story, you know? It really is. It really yeah. is. Who is so, who, so, uh, who's what, Emperor uh, Palpatine? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe that was Mary Magdalene, was it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, sure someone um, who knows the story better than I do could patch it all together. Yeah. yeah, the story weaves a lot of stuff in. They said it was based off of The Fortress, I think a Japanese movie, also off of the story of Ramayana from the Hindus of uh, Hanuman teaming up with Rama to go s rescue the princess from the Dark Lord. Mm. And Hanuman... Mm. That's the, Han Solo uh, Chewbacca. and Chewbacca, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Ian McDermott played, uh, you know, Palpatine. And this is a fascinating weave, but I was listening to the audio production that the BBC put together of Paradise Lost. And I was listening to the speech that the devil gives in, um, in uh, Pandemonium, uh, which is the house of all demons. And the mm -hmm. devil is giving this speech, and it's incredibly insightful and politically master. It's like the master's touch of manipulation for this speech to go forward. Uh, way back in 1667 is when Paradise Lost, right after the London fires, and this voice is like uh, weaving this this intrigue into the minds of these demons. And I'm listening, and I'm like, this sounds like Palpatine's manipulations of the Senate. I'm literally hearing the 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 political intrigue of the Star Wars playing out back in 1667 in Paradise Lost. And then I looked it up and guess who the voice actor was who was playing Satan in this recording? It was Ian McDermott. It's the right. same exact voice actor is playing the devil in Milton's Paradise Lost who played Emperor Palpatine. And then I look up an image of Palpatine sitting up on his, on his, uh, whatever his pulpit, and he's giving the speech, and he's surrounded by these circles of light that are like the the balconies of all the uh, political people around him. And then you look back on Milton's Paradise Lost, where the devil is giving the speech from the top of a dome in Pandemonium. It's the same image. They're literally. <laughs> They're literally reenacting uh, Milton's Paradise Lost in the Star Wars story, and they have the same actor playing both roles. I'm, I'm, I'm sure they could have been doing something like that. I mean, it is what they always do, isn't it? <clears throat> A lot of stories are told and retold. Yes. Um, this is um, another view of Jeddah with the, um, the cruiser that's coming above it is going to destroy it. Of course, this is from Star Wars. And of course, this is Masada with added star wars effects to it that's brilliant that the so ship brilliant. the ship on top of the mountain yeah on top of masada which is where it should be so this is the the roman cruiser from the evil roman empire that's about to destroy masada um wow. yeah it's i'm i'm sure it was based on the same thing so this this, this again this is hitting on some uh, some really strange and obscure research that i'm doing on the side uh, uh, but I just, I can't go without saying it. Um, Plato, uh, gosh, this is such a long story. It's really hard to bring everybody on the journey to, to and then just tell you the end result because it's so hard to believe. But, uh, uh, Plato is, um, he's at the pinnacle of the, um, okay. 
the Plato Symposium, if you put it, if you map out the seating order of the symposium onto the Enneagram, the personality sitting in the in the ring of sofas in the circular layout as they're passing the torch, talking about their different descriptions of love. Plato's not in the room. He's not there. He's a youth. He's not even he's not even present yet. He's late. He's the late one, late comer, uh, because he's an initiate in the future. But the position he's in is at the top of the Enneagram, and that that is the spirit of sloth, the spirit of balance. A late, it's a latecomer. So he's at the top, and I'm thinking about the plateau and how we're looking at a plateau, and how the plateau is like the fortress, this heavenly realm that looms up above and can see from all directions, is kind of all seeing. And so lately, I've been thinking about the the Platonic realm of forms and plateaus being strategic, uh, and there's much more to that, because his spirit is Orania, and Orania, that would be his muse, is Orania. She has a compass, she has a ball, so she has the, the realm of forms, astrology. And so now I'm thinking about the plateaus. The Orania. You Same got name. it. <laughs> you got it. And so, yeah, I'm thinking about Plato, plateaus, and uh, in astrology, you know, from that position, you would have a full horizon view to see the stars. You know, master astronomers would highly covet a plateau as a place of uh, optimal perspective. Mm. If, if people don't know, Orania comes from the Greek muse Orania, who was the queen of heaven. Um, so she was like an incarnation of Isis as the queen of heaven. So she's always... Uh, displayed with, um, you know, stars over a head and so on, um, which became embellished, uh, embellic of, uh, yeah, I, I've got some images of this, which might be interesting, actually. Let's, let's have a look. I'll yeah. see if I can find. Do, do you think like, uh, th we see this destruction of the like divine feminine goddess and seemingly it seems like the, the Jews, we're worshiping a, a female deity. It's a prevalent in uh, the Knights Templar. They, uh, the church, uh, killed them all because they were worshiping a female or had the head of John the Baptist. Whatever story you want to go with, but there's this female energy. That's why they killed them on Friday the Thirteenth, which has female energy. Uh, do you think like maybe it's because of the Romans uh, obfuscating? this idea of a female divinity or do you think it's because maybe the templars or or somebody of that was hiding the fact that there was this lineage of jesus and they wanted to keep that a secret and that's why they replaced it with uh the patriarchy rather than having uh the dualism well, certainly they did change it because uh, Mary Magdalene was, of course, the equal of Jesus because he was the sun, she was the moon. So, you know, the two heavenly mm -hmm. bodies in the sky above. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, there was there was a fairly large change at that point, I suppose you could say. Um, and Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother, I suppose, as well, uh, became embellic of of isis of course now can you see um mary there on the share mm -hmm. screen yeah mm -hmm. okay well this is actually this is probably mary the mother but since i believe they were mother and daughter anyway uh mary the virgin and mary magdalene were mother and daughter um she is embellic em an embellishment of um the description in in um Oh, what am I thinking of? Revelations, where there is a woman with 12 stars around her head standing on a um, crescent moon. Uh, this is this is Mary. So this is portrayed in many of these cathedrals, of course. Uh, this is the Magdalene, because uh, I don't know if you know, but there's a dress code here. If you see someone in blue and white, that's Mary the Virgin. If you see her in gold and green or orange and green, that's Mary Magdalene. Um, so this is the Magdalene, and as described in Revelations, she's got 12 stars around her head, and she's standing on the crescent moon. Um, so, and you'll see this quite a lot. Here she is again. 
if Jesus was and with Mary Magdalene, does that mean he is with his sister? Yeah, they had sister wives. Um, sister yeah, wives or from... his sister? Sister wives, because she was his sister and she married him. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, this was fairly common. You've got to remember that Cleopatra married both of her brothers. Um, no, no, that's King right. Agrippa II. Yeah, King Agrippa I... II of Judea at the very same time as this, was married to his sister, Ber Berenike. Um, the tradition of the sister wife was very, very common for the royalty. Yeah. It kept it within the family. Um, I just uh, think of sister wives as like, you know, like the Mormons having multiple wives and they're called sister wives. And that's why I was saying like, uh, no, I that's think why this was I was real. like, Mono, Mono Bazos married Queen Helena and they were brother and sister as well. Mm -hmm. This was highly common. Uh, and we get this from the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 9 5, um, okay. where Saul is wanting a sister wife. Um, so it says in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 5, have we not the power to lead about a sister wife as well as the other apostles do and the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Cephas is Peter, of course. Um, oh, so he's oh. asking, this is Saul, St. Paul, is asking for a sister wife hmm. because the other apostles have them. And so does St. Peter and the brothers of the Lord. They've all got sister wives. Why can't he have one? Now, if you read this in something like the American Standard, you get a very bad interpretation where it says a sister and a wife or a sister in the church or something like that. They get these very, very poor translations. Yes. But if, if you get a um, literal Bible, which is like the Rotherham Bible or the uh, Derby Bible, which don't try to interpret anything, they just write it as it is written. And in those books, those Bibles, it will say sister wife, because that's yeah. how it's written in the, in the Greek, because I mean, he was wanting a sister wife the same as Jesus had a sister wife, because Mary Magdalene was his sister. Um, in fact, he was probably married to Mary and Martha, because remember, they lived at the house of Simon. And that's another story as well, because um, it's been well known for a while, if you read the books of Robert Eisenman, uh, that um, Mary and Martha at the house of Simon were actually Mary Bothus and Martha Bothus, who were the daughters of Simon Bothus. So they were from the house of Simon. Now, the reason the, the reason that is um, important is because Mary Bothus was the richest woman in Judea. In fact, the whole, the richest uh, woman in the whole of the, um, uh, uh, yeah, the Near East. Now, when she got married and she married Jesus of Gamala, we're back to the same characters again. Um, she had a dowry of one million gold denarii. She was a millionaireess in gold denarii. In equivalent now today, that's worth about $26 billion dollars. Jeez, that, that was the wealth of this family and that was just her dowry that wasn't her wealth you know if you imagine oh, that you know during her dowry maybe she got 10 percent of the um the family's wealth well they were worth 260 billion dollars um these no were wonder she, she's got a ring of golden stars around her head <laughs> it's, <laughs> yes. it's just yeah she was she her. was royalty wow. um but yeah, in, in the picture we've got here, this is actually Mary the mother because it's blue and white. Yeah. Um, and I'm just going to flash down because um, let me get to these pictures again. So uh, this, a... this imagery has continued. So here's another one. This is a typical sort of Catholic imagery. But you get the 12 gold stars, and they were supposed to be gold, around mm -hmm. her head with her blue uh, cloak. Well, we've copied that imagery because that imagery, of course, is from Arania. This is Arania. <laughs> we were talking about Arania, Absolutely. the uh, Greek muse Arania. And here she is in her blue and white because you get the blue sky and the white puffy clouds. She looks And thick. around her head are the stars. This is, this is the Greek Arania. 
Um, and it's been copied, obviously, in Christian symbolism. That's why we get this imagery. And then it's been copied into the uh, uh, European Union because that's where the EU flag comes from. Mm. Now, did so the, wear blue and white with silver? Uh, probably. Um, we, we don't. Yes, probably. I, I can't remember. But the EU flag came from that description in the book of Revelations about Mary having 12 stars, right? That's why there are 12 stars. You know, initially they made this fabrication about the, well, there's only 12 states in the EU. Um, but now, of course, there's like 26 and there's, there's still only 12 stars. Colombia. Uh, but the guy who actually made this flag admitted that it came from the book of Revelations. Wow. So yeah, that's where this symbolism comes from. And this symbolism goes down through the ages. Um, it's all... It's also like Columbia it's all symbolic. Too, he's his... in front of the mountain. In the... Yeah, um, this, well, yes, in front of a tower, probably. This is another image of um, Mary Magdalene. You see she's always got a skull. It's a common imagery of Mary Magdalene. She's always got a skull. Um, <clears throat> that's because a skull is, is Calvary. It's Golgotha. It Yes. Um, and that's where Jesus was crucified. So it's embellished. Uh, it's emblematic is the word I'm looking for there. Emblematic, emblematic of the um, of Jesus being crucified because he was crucified at Calvary, which is a skull in Latin, um, or Golgotha. And Golgotha is a skull in Aramaic. Um, so that's the symbolism we get. The other symbolism we get is this. Oh, that's too big. Let me make that smaller. Um, that where like Mary that? Magdalene, she's the one on the right, obviously. She's in the green and gold. That's typical of Mary Magdalene. And she's holding an alabaster, alabaster jar. That is because she is the Mary um, uh, from Bethany at yeah. the house of Simon, who anointed mm -hmm. Jesus with, uh, with oil. Yes. And we've just had that, of course, yesterday with Prince Charles, who was anointed with oil right, at the coronation. So this is more important than people make out within the New Testament. Mary Magdalene anointed Jesus with oil, and it wasn't just a, a sign of devotion. Uh, this was the ceremony that would make him into the king. This is how you make a Messiah king. Because remember, Christ and Messiah just mean the anointed king. Right. It's not a so, spiritual name. It just means the king. Right. Um, so so we're in Taurus right now. And in the Taurus uh, Pisces. Uh, station is the origin of Eurydnus. Eurydnus is the Jordan River of the sky. And so uh, an anointing or a baptism or a initiation point would be in, integral to the milk. That's also uh, corresponds to the Milky Way. Like the milk comes out of the cow, we're in Taurus where the cow is. So there's all of this baptismal anointing energy around Taurus for sure. Mm. Oh, in the, in the monthly um, zodiac, yes, yeah, um, monthly, yes. yes. But um, uh, as 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 far as Mary Magdalene, what she is doing, she is anointing Jesus as the King. This is when he became the King of the Jews. Yeah. So he became, this is a secular king. This is nothing to do with spirituality. This is when he became a secular king of the Jews. That's why he was known as the king of the Jews. And the person who's doing the anointing was Mary Magdalene. Now, if you go to yesterday's ceremony in uh, Westminster Abbey, the person doing the anointing of King Charles mm -hmm. was the Archbishop of Canterbury, the most important priest in the land. And therefore, it's indicating, strongly indicating, that Mary Magdalene was the most important priestess in the land. Otherwise, she wouldn't have been doing the anointing of Jesus when he became king. And so that ceremony, that little ceremony, was much more important than, than people sort of realize and make out. Uh, yeah. it's, it's when he gained the title of Christ or Messiah, meaning king jesus because he was a real king and you um, know they called they called uh charles king of kings and in, in the ceremony they, they use that word choice uh yes and i 
I've heard that that's actually a sultan, that a sultan is considered a king of kings. And I know that when one fella came into power in Egypt, he claimed to be a sultan. They overthrew him and made him change his title to just a king. So it was like a yes. demotion. So, well, so, it, it, it was. There were, there were quite a few king of kings. They used to use that term in Parthia as well. They used it when um, you when you had an empire. So you had an empire with many client kings underneath you. <clears throat> and then you would have a king of kings who was the chief of the kings. Same even in, in um, uh, Gaul in the sort of uh, 7th, 8th centuries. You would have many sort of dukes. I suppose you wouldn't call them kings, but you'd have many uh, lords or dukes in the land. And then you would have Louis the First, who was the king of kings, um, wow. because he was the chief of the kings. And so, yeah, that was um, a common title. We don't really have. I suppose we have lords still in Britain. We don't have subordinate kings, but we we still do have lords and earls and people like that. And then you get the king of kings that, uh, on top of it. The British Empire uh, is, controls the world through uh, marine admiralty. And that. Yeah, America I suppose in that sense, during the, um, during the empire, we had a king of kings. So Queen Victoria would have been the queen of queens because she did have subordinate princes, you know, in the various lands that we were governing, like India and so on. And she would be the primary monarch she would be the queen of queens i suppose um, some people believe that the uh the american federal government is controlled by the british monarchy well i think that ended a long time ago <laughs> i i don't <laughs> think we have much influence over there anymore just because um, six, the 16 bloodlines of the british monarchy are always involved in our presidencies and when they're not the president is either assassinated or impeached okay yeah i, I don't know american history that well to to know the relationships i do know that we were paying america back for the second world war for 50 years we didn't finish paying america um for the our war debt until 2005 oh, when we made the last installment that um, is very interesting yeah america we got charged for it germany got their money free so they they got reparations to rebuild germany um, and those reparations came from Britain, who was paying America for 50 years <clears throat> until we could pay back our war debt. <laughs> you no, know, America owed France from the Revolutionary War, and I think the French sold that debt to the British so that we owed them. And that's possibly how it ended That in 2005, you say? 2005 was, yes, was our last payment to America. Oh, I, what's this uh, Cronte, Mary... Image five eleven. You're five eleven. Let's have a look. Five eleven. Uh, it's the Orant. So um, uh, these are from southern France. So we get mm -hmm. a lot of these. And if you go to the museum, this is from the Al Museum in southern France. Uh, and the Al Museum, I have to say, is one of the best museums for Roman artifacts because this was heavily Roman in this era, in the first second centuries. Uh, they've got some of the biggest theatres and um, amphitheatres in the whole of the Roman Empire there. It was very rich. And they got lots of these sarcophagi. And these are very early. These are like third century. And they're obviously Christianized, But not obviously so, because they call this person the Arant. And she's sitting there with her arms splayed out. And Arant means as an orator. So she's giving a sermon. Uh, showing how important this person is. So that's the Arant. But if you look on the other side of that sarcophagus, you get this guy, mm -hmm. who's obviously the Jesus character. <laughs> yeah. um, and we get the same here. There's another one. Um, the disciples here. at his feet there? Uh, on that one, probably. Um, I don't know who the two characters at the bottom will be. Might even be a son and a daughter, if you want to really be. Oh. Um <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it could well be because here's another one. Here's the Arant on the left, and on the right, you get a guy holding a lamb. Well, who's who holds the Lamb of God? You know, this is the Jesus yeah. character. So it's quite obvious that the Arant is actually Mary Magdalene. 
But the Arant on many of these sarcophagi is the most important person on the sarcophagus, like this one. The central person is the Arant, not the Jesus character, but the Mary Magdalene character, because Mary Magdalene was supposed to have ended up in the south of France. Here's another one. The central character is the Arant. It's Mary Magdalene. Wow. Um, and this is supposed to be the skull of Mary Magdalene. I don't think this is. This is just um, something they've made up. This is in Saint-Maxime yeah. in the south of France. She was supposed to have sailed after the Jewish revolt, because I say this is all to do with the Jewish revolt. They all got kicked out of the country. <clears throat> and Mary Magdalene was supposed to have gone to uh, the south of France. Uh, and she ended up at uh, Saint-Marie-de-Lamar, which is on the Mediterranean coast next to the Rhone Valley. And from there, she went up the Rhone Valley. So they, they still hold a festival every year uh, honoring the date where she came ashore at Saint-Marie-de-Lamar. Uh, but then she is supposed to have gone up the Rhone Valley. Now, they say that she went to Saint-Maxime uh, and Aix-en-Provence, which is slightly towards the east of the Rhone. I don't think she did. Um, I think she went up to Orange instead. And I'm not sure if I've got, yeah, I've got some pictures here. Um, this is um, oh, this is a classical romantic image of um, Orange. This is how it looks today. This is the Roman um, arch, triumphal arch at the uh, boundaries of Orange. And it's from Orange, of course, that we get the Orant as well, because or means gold in wow. Latin. Um, from which we get, you know, Orania. We were talking about Orania. Yeah. So we get this connection between gold and heaven because Orania is the queen of heaven. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the sun being the golden orb in the sky above. This is where we get ore from, or orange comes from ore, meaning gold. Um, and this is the um, theater, Roman theater, of course, in orange. And this was supposed to be the, the greatest wall in the Roman Empire. And you can see it's, it's quite a, that's quite a wall, that is. Yeah. <clears throat> and this is the theater from, in, they still use it. It's still in use today, 2,000 years later. And uh, when I was there, the play that was on was Mary Magdalene. <laughs> and you can see her here. Uh, holding the alabaster jar, so that's Mary Magdalene. They've got oh, her in the a, wrong colours. Um, that's the that's an that's, actual image. Red. Yeah, they made this enormous great painting. Yeah. Um, so is, the backdrop for the play is this enormous great painting <laughs> of because um, that well, that painting yeah. has got to be like thirty foot high. <laughs> now wait, it's uh, mm. it's it's intentionally off kilter, right? The way yes. I'm seeing yeah. it. Okay, so the dimensions of that diamond is the great diamond in the constellation of Virgo. Okay, right. It, it's it's intentionally geometrically. Um, it it's at first glance you think it's geometrically flawed, but that is the actual dimensions of the great diamond of Virgo. That's ah, okay. Yes. Point. They could have been doing that, but look at the people down below to see how big it is. I mean, a person is six foot, and you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten times six foot. So, I mean, that's like 50, 60 foot high. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> that's a big painting. But you can see yeah. the size of the theater as well. I mean, that's not even up to the roof of the theater. Right. Um, so, so, the, and she's holding, she's holding that jar, right, in her the hands. alabaster jar. So, th so that's the crater constellation, which is also in Virgo. Is this? It's okay. kind of, the, it's like the holy grail of the sky. So, right, all of all of the ingredients <coughs> of the of the zodiac are right here on offer. That's so cool. Yeah. Astro and it was, yep. It was from that jar, of course, that she anointed Jesus. So, um. Wow. Uh, yeah, lots of symbolism. So that's Orange, and Orange was eventually led by this guy, uh, who is um, Guillaume d'Orange, or Guillaume Cologne. Uh, he was the prince of Orange in the south of France. So it's a real town. This is a, a town in the south of Fra France called Orange, or again, 
um, the uh, the the golden city, and that's why he's wearing a golden cape. Um, now this is interesting because uh, they eventually became the Dutch. So he is the Prince of Orange because that's the name of the city. But eventually, after a long and torturous history, um, as an independent principality in France, the only independent principality, uh, they got kicked out by Louis the Fourteenth, and they went to Holland. So when you hear of the princes of Orange in Holland, which who are still influential today, they still run Holland today. Uh, that's where they came from. They were descended from this guy in the south of France. Um, that's why they, they are known as the princes of Orange. But his symbol was the single star on a blue background. That was the symbol of Orange. And of course, in the EU, they have 12 of those symbols. Um, and the thing about this, this principality, this, this monarchy, well, monarchy, they were princes. Again, they weren't allowed to call themselves kings because the king was Louis. Um, so they were called princes. And they were Jewish. So this was a Jewish principality. Right. And that's why he was known as um, uh, Guillaume, which became William, of course, Guillaume Cortnez which means the hooked nose. Mm. But in French, it sounds like cornet. So they've got a cornet as their symbol because it, wow. it's a bit of wordplay again. It sounds like yeah. cornet. And note that the symbol <clears throat> of um, orange is the three oranges because they are or they are golden. Three sun symbols. But that three sun, sun symbols became the... Um, the symbol of Odessa. So the symbol of Odessa we were talking about a long time ago has the same symbology. It's the three, uh, wow. the three oranges. So, um, so, so there's a there's a a lot of research around the the triple sun here. Uh, you know, it's also a symbol of pawn shops. In, in, yes. in a lot of in a the lot three of communities. Balls, yes, you've got it. And um, why, why is that? I don't know why that is. Uh, it's really morbid, but I just it's it's worth mentioning. Um, it, ha <laughs> it has to it has to do with the eunuch class. And mm. when well, when a eunuch gets the full the full treatment, we call it a smoothie. Uh, the scar the scar that is generated from that is uh, creates three rings, and they're not separate like that. They're actually fused together. It's like it's kind of three lobes uh, all together. So. There's something really morose, I think, <laughs> but it's preserved culturally and passed down. And it still has that meaning if you think about what a pawn shop is. You know, you're giving up your material attachments, you know, and that's mm. what the unit class was doing. They were cutting themselves off from the mundane and and channeling everything up to this higher ethereal, whatever, mental plane. Right. Well, that's that's interesting because we we have that in. Um, I'm just quickly looking up a um, a quote here. Um, we we have that in the gospel story as well, because I don't know if you know. I've got a cat here that's being annoying. Let us say down there, please. The cat master. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know if you know, but uh, Jesus asked for his uh, disciples to mm -hmm. become eunuchs, to castrate themselves. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so again, well, this is not taught. Yeah, you're talking about well the dog. don't want to. And being the founder of the Essenes, <laughs> and that was one of the Essenes' uh, things, is that they would become eunuchs. <clears throat> Which is interesting because well, if that was true, then why would them up why again. would Jesus be married, or why would he have any children? Oh if he... well, be because you don't have to get castrated, you know, when you're young. You can do it when you're older. Uh -huh. um, so it was really a priestly thing. So you would only get castrated when you became the priest or the high priest, and of course you could do that in later life. So you could have your family, you could you know do everything, and then you know in your forties or fifties. Um, you could become oh, a priest, okay. as many monarchs used to do that. You know, they were a monarch for many years and then became a priest. Um, but uh, this comes from Matthew 19, 
<clears throat> excuse me, Matthew 19, 12. And uh, Jesus says, there are some eunuchs who were born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. Uh, but there are some eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is let, a, able to receive it, let him receive it. Wow. So he's asking his disciples to castrate themselves. You know, 1912 um, is when we uh, removed from the, when they changed our financial system in the United States. Okay, it yes. Could be, could be construed as a castration ritual. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's pretty far out. Uh, yes, I suppose it was. If, if you had everything taken away from you, yes. Um, I'm just... Um, looking up a uh, Edessa talk. Let's have a look here. Reminds yes. me of that sublime um, song. Because this was shop. a famous group. Yeah, this all comes from a pawn shop. This was a pawn famous shop. group. Pawn, pawn, pawn. Um, <laughs> in, in this era, they were known as the Galileans or the Galli. Yes. Um, and of course, Jesus was a Galilean. This is why we know this probably applied to Jesus as well, that he was a eunuch as well at some point in his life, um, because uh, this was a well-known sect. They were the keepers of the sacred stone. And remember, his primary disciple was called Peter, meaning the stone. He was the keeper of the sacred stone. As is the and ben we ben have this. Uh... As is who? Sorry, say again. Is this the Ben Ben stone? Yeah, we can go through that. This is the Ben Ben stone. So, but um, just quickly on what uh, Jesus was. Um, Lucian says how these galley were made. So how they castrated themselves. So this comes from uh, Lucian 50 to 53. Um, he says on these days, uh, these celebration days, uh, men become the galley. While the rest are playing flutes and performing uh, writes a frenzy comes upon many and he throws off his clothes and rushes to the center with a great shout and takes up a sword um, and castrates himself and then he rushes through the city holding his testicles in his hands uh, and he takes female clothing and women's adornment from whichever house he throws the testicles into <laughs> so these were the tes <laughs> testicle tosses of uh, syria um who became the galley or the Galileans. And remember that Jesus was a Galilean. Um, and we have this as well from Josephus Flavius, who says that these people were involved in the Jewish revolt. We're back to the Jewish revolt again. And these were the, um, the assassins, like the Sicarii you were talking about before. The, many of the Sicarii were Galileans uh, and they were trends basically. Um, they're a bit like sort of um, Mulvaney, this new guy who's, who seems to be into it. Um, but anyway, <laughs> Josephus says that, um, <laughs> you know the guy I'm meaning. Um, he says the Galileans indulged themselves in feminine wantonness. They decked their hair and put on women's garments and were smeared with ointments that they might appear very comely. Um, they had paints under their eyes and imitated not only the ornaments, but also the lusts of women. But while their faces looked like the faces of women, they killed with their right hands. And while their mm. gait was effeminate, they attacked men and became warriors and drew their swords from under their finely decked dresses and ran everybody through that they alighted upon. Assassins. So Man, that was that... the Galileans. And remember that Jesus <laughs> was a Galilean. Uh, so it was um, St. Peter. And remember that they recognized St. <laughs> Peter by his voice. So did he have a squeaky high-pitched voice because he had been castrated? Wow. He um, like, sounded like Mickey Mouse, maybe? Yeah, possibly. <laughs> wow. Man, that's so psychologically ponderous, you know? Mickey Mouse. <laughs> like, the three circles, too, of Mickey Mouse. His head in his ears. <laughs> yes, for his ears, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it never stops, does it? There's a lot of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a, a lot of this symbolism around. Um, I'm, if we want to quickly have a look at the 
um, the Ben Ben. I've got um, some images of the Ben Ben as well. If we you are can have a look at those. At almost about three hours and about five more minutes. Uh, do you okay. want to wrap it up with a Ben Ben and then uh, we'll be done, or we can yes. keep going? I, if you guys have time, I got time. Well, if if my voice keeps going, I don't mind keeping going. We'll see. I tend to my voice tends to run out after a while. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm excited for some Ben Ben because they just relocated it recently, right? Yes, it was just, it was just moved around, and there are so many theories around the history of the Ben Ben stone, and so, and if they if these theories are even five percent true, it is fascinating beyond beyond. It's the canoptic stone. Company. It's the well. I can probably add a little gland. to that because um, I have a slightly different take on the Ben Ben because I traced its history. It's um, pertinent to all mm. of these um, religions. It's been everywhere. This um, sacred stone. So, can you see a bird sitting on a stone? Yes. Yes. Good. Sorry, I've got cat hose hairs on my face because the cat jumped on my lap. <laughs> um, so is. this is the Ben Ben. This is what you're talking about. This is the, the, the sacred uh, stone of Egypt. And this was supposed to be at Heliopolis. And as you can see, it was a conical stone. Um, supposed to be the primeval piece of land from their um, creation epic with a phoenix standing on the top of it. So it's associated with the phoenix you can see he's got the rays of the sun um mm. on his head um so this was the ben ben but of course it was taken from egypt by the uh, greeks when the don't tread on oh, stupid cat um he keeps treading on the keyboard and you never know which button he's going to press <laughs> um so it was taken from egypt by the uh, greeks and it ended up in delphi so this is the um uh, the stone when it went to mm -hmm. Delphi. And as you can see, it's a conical stone. It was supposed to be Fellows. a meteorite. Um, and from there, uh, so it's not very big. It's probably about this size. I mean, it's only about you know 18 inches, two foot high. So it's not huge. It was supposed to be a meteorite. So it's supposed to be metallic um, and uh, possibly magnetic as well, which is where it got its otherworldly um, forces from and then it went to Parthia we were talking about Parthia Persia um, it went there with the Greeks of course because all of those lands in the east all of Iraq and Iran they were all Greek and uh, so here is the stone in uh, Parthia and here we see Apollo sitting on the stone and you see it's got this cross hatching on it a lot of these stones have this for some reason it had it had netting on it I mean, we're not quite sure what that netting actually was. Um, but then it came back again to Edessa. Uh, and I think it came back with Theamusa Orania when they were kicked out of Parthia. And um, here you see it's um, a square box in a temple. And they say that this is a cubic um, Ben Ben, or they call it a, a Bethel, they call it. But I don't think it's cubic at all. I think if you look at the bottom of this, you can see some, on the top one, you can see some feet underneath the cube. Mm. Um, so it's a box in a temple. And on the middle one, you might be able to see a wheel under it because mm -hmm. sometimes they put this on a cart. And if I raise this up, you'll see another one uh, with some sort of chariot with wheels on the bottom of it. Um, so this is not the... the um, this is not the Omphalos. They called it the Omphalos. The Ben Ben in Greece became known as the Omphalos stone. But I don't think this is the Omphalos. This is the box that they put it in. Yeah. So this is the Ark of the Covenant. So here uh, on the top one, you see the Ark of the Covenant in Edessa. This is why Edessa was important, uh, why they were Jewish, why, you know, people respected this particular royalty is because they owned the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ben Ben stone because it wasn't very big. You could actually put it in a wooden box. And so this is the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, that's what the Ark of the Covenant had. If you remember, um, Moses put the, the stones 
from Mount Sinai in the Ark of the Covenant. And it was probably this stone. The same as the um, Jacob's pillow was this stone as well. The stone that he anointed with oil. Um, and talking of Ark of the Covenants, here is one. This is the Ark of Tutankhamun. So Whoa. these were quite common. We know all about these arcs. And this is exactly the same as the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. Um, it even has the brass rings underneath it wow. for the carrying poles. So these carrying poles can go in and out. Um, mm -hmm. And this was the Ark of Tutankhamun. And it kept all of their important documents. It, some of them w were used for money. It kept their gold. Yeah. Some of them obviously were kept for the images of the gods. They used to put images of the gods in these things. And some of them obviously had sacred stones inside them. Right. Um, so, uh, Ralph, you uh, you may find this interesting. The, the, the side of the arc here, not the broad side, but the narrow side, uh, mm -hmm. it has a your standard house. You know, it's got a three shaped triangle on the on the top, the square on the mm -hmm. bottom. Uh, that is kind of funny enough. That's like a trivium quadrivium, three and the four. The sacred com combination makes a house. But the shape of the constellation Libra is exactly in the shape of the triangle above and a and a rectangle below. And Libra right. is. Yeah, and so Libra is like the library. That's the uh, the law. It's all these. Uh, it's also tenants. The word tenant is a law, and it's also the tenth constellation. So you like put ten, and then you reverse it. Net ten net. Either way you turn the tenants, uh, it's always going to be in groupings of ten and have signs of Libra on it. Hmm. And it's the That's standard kind of, shape, of course, of a, a Greek temple will look like that as well. Yeah. Um, they yeah. use that sort of same imagery for that. Um, cool. That's cool. So here is, oh, Banks. no, that's the same image. Banks We've already seen that, that one. That's the square box in the temple. But then from Edessa, uh, this stone, because Edessa lost some of its power during the Jewish revolt because their army was decimated, etc. So this stone went down to Emesa which is another place. It's near to modern Damascus. Um, it's where yes. the revolt started, uh, you know, the Syrian revolt 15 years ago, Homs and Hama. That is Emesa. And so this stone ended up in Emesa, which was a separate monarchy. So there was two monarchies in that region. Um, and here again, we see it as a stone. So it's not in its box anymore. They've taken it out of its box. And here we see it again as a conical stone, uh, exactly the same as it was when it was in Delphi. Yeah. But now it's in Syria, in Emesa. And mm. you can see it's got the um, phoenix embossed on it again. So uh, in the center, you see the body of the phoenix. And then it's got two wings left and right, uh, legs down the bottom. Uh, and you can't quite see the head up the top, but it's embossed with the image of the phoenix um, because it was always associated with the phoenix because it was a meteorite. And of course, a meteorite comes in to the atmosphere as a great fiery ball, which the phoenix was. It was a great fiery bird, you know, covered in fire, flames and fire. Um, I, and... I, always, I always love pointing out that the word cone in reverse is Enoch. So... Oh, right. So Enoch yes. went up and the, and the stone came down. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. And then it went to Rome. So yeah. <clears throat> we were talking about Jesus wanting to become the emperor of Rome and failing. Well, this guy succeeded. So this is Emperor Elagabalus, because now the stone was called the Elagabal. They changed its name again. Uh, and he was from the same families as the Jesus guy. Remember, I said that Jesus was from the Edessan royal family. Well, this guy was from the Emesan royal family, both in Syria, both very closely related monarchies, although I think they operated separately. One was up in Edessa. This, this lot were down at Homs and Hammer near Damascus at a place called Emesa. 
which is virtually the same name. Uh, and they venerated the same stone. The Edessans had the Elagabal, and now this guy had the Elagabal, and this Ooh. guy became emperor of Rome, which well, is exactly what the Jesus guy had been trying to do, but failed miserably. This right. guy became emperor of Rome in the 220s AD, and he is known as Emperor Elagabalus. And he was disliked, and is known as the Mad Emperor, because he castrated himself. Wow. Because the priests of this stone were the galley priests who looked after the stone. Um, the, the galley priests were the priests of Cybele, or Cybele, as I should call her. Cybele and Attis. Yeah. And of course, Attis was the eunuch. He was castrated yeah. as well. And so it, to become a priest of the Elagabal stone, you had to imitate Attis. And that's why you had to castrate yourself. And this emperor castrated himself. <clears throat> In fact, he might have had a panoctomy as well, is what's rumored to have happened. And of course, the Romans didn't like that because it was illegal in Rome. So they didn't like this guy because he was an Eastern monarch anyway and had all this strange Eastern dress and Eastern strange ways. But also he was a <clears throat> he was a, um, a eunuch, which wasn't allowed in the Roman Empire. And then he defiled the um, Vestal Virgins, which wasn't allowed as well. Um, and so he was killed after only about um, four years. Um, and so uh, so his name is hitting a chord for me. I know it's not the same person because it's totally not even close in the time frame, but Elcibiades is a character in the symposium. He's a late arrival. He comes twirling in drunk into the party, professes his love to Socrates. But I just find it very fascinating that uh, Ella Kabbalis and Elcibiades philologically have a, have a correspondence yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm not sure if that correspondence works entirely. L. L. Um, the Elagabal uh -huh. means the uh, mountain of God, and as yes, you can see, it's a small mountain. It's not a very big mountain. It's a mound, <clears throat> but L means God, and uh -huh. um, excuse me. <coughs> L means God, and uh, Gabal is Aramaic for a mountain. Um, and we know that that is referring to the sun god because the Greeks used to call it the Heliogabal. Helio as in Helios, the sun god. Wow. So whichever way you want to look at it, it's the small mountain of God yes. um, because it, it's, it's a sunstone. It came from the sun, so it came from the gods and it looks like a mountain. And wow. note on this one, I'll, I'll zoom in with this image. Um, again, it's embossed with the image of the phoenix you can see the phoenix on it there two yeah. wings either side body in the middle and in his beak he's holding a a wreath or something wow. and he's on so a chariot he's, we got that same star again too a, yeah the same oh, yeah. star again um, so, which is probably in this case venus because that's the sunstone so that star is maybe venus yeah. So, so there are a lot of threads. And again, I know the timeline doesn't match up, but there are so many threads all at once. Elcibiades is wearing a wreath. Uh, Socrates tells Elcibiades that you will have uh, instructors, a four-part initiation process. Your instructors will be uh, masters of the horses, which was actually the middle class. Or no, it's a priest class, the masters of the horses, in that there, there are four horse masters will teach you... Uh, a four-part education process from Tribe the east Dan. and yeah and these horses are coming from the east they're moving west there's a mm. lot of Elcibiades kind of baked into this um mm. and and Elcibiades is um he's also drunken he's like he's not uh he's uncouth he's like um mad he's unwanted he's unwelcome yeah he's kind of look <laughs> he's frowned on by the by the by the saints this right. is really fun. Th thank you, Rob. Well, I'm loving the, this. The, the other strange thing, well, two more strange things before we finish on this, is uh, this stone is rather famous because everybody knows what this stone is, even if they haven't seen it. Because the other name for this stone is the Holy Grail. Mm. 
So this is the holy grail that everybody was looking for. Oh my um, gosh. And we get this from Wolfram von Eschenbach, who writes Arthurian legend. I, I've got a book on Arthurian legend called The Grail Cipher, um, because there are many similarities between the gospel story and Arthurian legend, which um, we can go through in another talk. Yeah, next time um, we have you, can we get into the Grail legend? Yeah, That'd we can do that another time. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the yeah. things he talks about is is the Holy Grail, of course, and he says. It is a sacred sunstone. It's a meteorite that fell from heaven. And of course, this is the meteorite that fell from heaven. So oh the grail itself God. has four, four sort of facets. You know, on the surface, it's, it's a cup that held the, the blood of Christ. So it's either the San Rael or the San Real. It's either the holy dish or it's the royal blood. And therefore, it's a bloodline. So on the second um, aspect of the grail, we, yeah. we again get this from Arthurian legend where a new knight is being made into the grail um, round table. And at the round table, this holy grail is displayed. Um, and they've got a new knight who's being initiated, I suppose, into the rites of the uh, knights of the round table um and he's called Firefits. he's the knight from the east he came from comes from mesopotamia um and so they parade the grail in front of him and they say can you see the grail and he says no all i can see is this princess holding a green cloth and of course the other knights fall about laughing because the grail is the princess because the grail is a bloodline and she yeah. holds the bloodline the princess yeah. holds and so the grail is her, her womb basically that's why it's grail shaped it's shaped like a womb Ralph, um, this is this is hitting so many i wish i could like share my screen with you right now on my project right now elsabiades he's in the eighth position there are two tarot cards with that are the number eight one is the lion and the other one is the star card, but I'm looking at the way I have them set up, and it looks like your coin right here. The, uh, in the Thoth deck, the Hor of Babylon, she's riding on the lion that's facing to the from the east, going to the west. And the other card, the star card, is a huge orb. I mean, it literally, if I could take your picture here on this coin and superimpose it on Elcibiades, the late arrival to the symposium. Uh, and it's also the blood lion. We're talking about blood lions. Well, this poor Babylon, she's holding the lion with a red cord. It's mm -hmm. like, uh, oh, and the star card, she's literally bathing in the Holy Grail. She's bathing herself with a cup, with a sacred cup from the heavens. And mm -hmm. the name of that constellation is the Crator. So the fallen stone from the heavens would create a crater. You know, it's like just so cool how this mm. this Holy Grail myth is fitting my Holy Grail myth. And mine also comes from a circle, a round table of sovereigns sitting around in a circle. Just had to throw that all on because it's so exciting. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, uh, this is certainly, uh, you, you were talking about the coronation and how it might have been at the coronation. This stone is still um, still important, obviously, to some people because... It does appear in, in films every now and then. And I'm not quite sure what they're trying to portray by this. Um, but um, I, I was sitting in a cinema watching um, James Bond, as one does. <clears throat> and it was just, it, it wasn't actually a very good film. I think it was Skyfall, this one. And I wasn't terribly interested. Um, but they had this story about James Bond running across North Africa. And he goes to a crater. I don't know if you remember this one. There's this big meteor crater. And they take James Bond into this observatory. Um, and, you know, the evil, uh, the evil guy takes them into this um, uh, observatory. And there, sitting in the middle of this observatory, is the Omphala stone. This is wow. the Alagabal. Wow. And I don't know why it was there, because it didn't really take much part in the actual film. And then this, the, the baddie, uh, you know, 
gives this speech about how this is the oldest stone in the universe and how lonely this stone is. It's been in existence for billions of years. And now he has this stone in his observatory. And there's Bond and his sidekick sitting there looking at the Ella Gabal stone. And you can see it's the same stone because it's supposed to be a meteorite. And here so, is this meteorite sitting in a Bond film. I think, wow. is there any cor- is it there? Is there any correlations between uh, like this stone, this egg, uh, shape and like the Fabro- Fabroge eggs? I, I think so, because I mean, they are following on the um, um, the lingams, of course, of, of India. And a lingam will look like this. It'll look like a dome. Uh-huh. But if you take a lingam out of its socket, a lingam looks like this. And therefore, a lingam is both both phallic and an egg. It's ah. both at the same time. And so you can have, you know, um, a androgynous stone, maybe. I don't know what you would call it, or a hermaphrodite stone. It's both, um, right. it's both phallic and egg at the same time. And of course, a lingam, if you read that backwards, if you like re- reading things backwards, but if you read a lingam backwards, it's a magdalene. It's a magdal. Nice. That's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. And a magdal, of course, is a tower. It's a phallus. Right. Mary Magdalene was not Mary of the Tower. She was Mary of the phallus, Mary the penis. Ah. Uh, because we know that from the Old Testament. Because remember, Queen Macca, who was one of the Israelite queens, was deposed from her position as queen because she had been venerating a phallus. Uh, That comes from the Old Testament. If you read it in the Old Testament, in the King James, of course, it'll say an idol. And that doesn't mean very much. But in the um, Aramaic, it's a mistafa, I think. And I didn't know what that meant. And then I looked it up in in the uh, Vulgate, which is in Latin. And it said it was a priapus. Uh, and I knew what a priapus right, was. Oh, yeah. yeah. And for, for those who don't know what a priapus was, priapus was a Roman godlet with this enormous great penis. Um, <laughs> That's very right. So at yeah, last, I had a translation that, I, you know, I understood. So Queen Macca was deposed for venerating a penis, a big wow. phallic object. Uh, <laughs> so, and we get... So- uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to point out uh, the 007 brings forward uh, John D. Yes, and when we're talking he was 007. Sacred, yes, so sacred bloodlines and John D. might be indicating that uh, that birth child from the wife swap, who I think his name was Arthur, the the son that uh, I think John D.'s wife had uh, Edward Kelly's child from the swap. Ah. And he kind of fades into obscurity in uh, probably intentionally. So there could be a bloodline back to the John D thing. Ah, ah. Which is yeah, I don't just... know his story well enough. So yes, I'll have yeah. to have a look at that. Yeah. But just finishing a... off with this stone, because it was used in the coronation, of course, yesterday. <clears throat> that is a fake stone. It's not a real stone. Um, so when Edward the First, this is back in the 13th century, maybe in the 12th century. Uh, when Edward I defeated the Scots, he said, I want this sacred stone because it was supposed to be in Scotland. It had been used as the coronation sc- stone for the Scots for a few hundred years. <clears throat> and they said, OK, here it is. And they just gave him this very ordinary slab of um, sandstone. But of course, that wasn't the real Ella Gabal. It wasn't the real Ben Ben. Um, at all. They call it the Stone of Scone, of course, up there. Um, it was a fake, and they gave it to Edward I, and that's the stone that's been underneath the coronation chair uh, in England and Britain for the last, you know, 800 years, and has wow. been at the center of 38 coronations, I think, ever since. But it is a fake. And when I went up to um, Scotland, because, you know, I'm a Freemason as well, Um, I went to a Templar Lodge because they still have Knights Templar, uh, modern Knights Templar up in Scotland. So I went to a lodge meeting of the uh, Templars. And the the master there said that they still have the Stone of Scone, the proper one. 
But what he described was not this stone so much, although he said it was the same stone, but the stone they had a, a drawing of it um, was more like a curling stone, if you know what one of those is. So in Canada and, and Scotland, they have this, it's, it's like bowling, it's like 10 pin bowling, but they do it with um, stones on ice and they throw these stones across the ice. Yeah. And their yeah. stones, how would you describe them? It's like a hockey puck, a puck? like a large, yeah, like, a, puck? like a hockey puck, but much larger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he, he says that is the stone that they've got in Scotland. And it is odd because um, it may be metallic. It has the power of levitation, according, uh, according to them. I, I yeah. never saw this, of course, so I've got no idea if this is true or not. They yeah. said it has the power of levitation and it has to be held down, otherwise it will float away. Wow. Um, and um, I think it, it's actually got more to do with magnetism because I think this is where we get the story of the Arthurian story of the sword in the stone. Mm -hmm. Because if it was very strongly magnetic and you as a knight came up to this stone with an iron sword, then the hand of God would just come out from nowhere and grab your sword and take it out of your hands. Yes. And pin it onto this stone. Now, that would be a very unusual, mysterious um, action that you could not explain, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Right. It, it would, would look be like very will, miraculous. Right, like the will of God. Yeah, it just yeah. pulled your sword out of your hand. And it's invisible. You can't see anything that's happening. It's just it's pulled out of your hand. That would be a very mysterious force, which might give this stone an element of mystery and power. Um, but of course, Arthur, King Arthur, had no problem. He could take his sword on and off this stone without any problem because he had a bronze sword. Ah, mm -hmm. <laughs> nice trick. <laughs> um, so it could be a story like this, and this is why we have this story, because there is this sacred metallic magnetic um, meteorite that's been knocking around many of these monarchies hmm. for the last three stroke 4,000 years, something like that. Um, anyway, why it was in a Bond film, I've got no idea. It had no relevance to the story. Yeah. Apart from introducing this shape um, and this provenance to a new generation. I don't know. I don't know if that's the... Well, I think her dress is very... Back to... Her dress is very yes, I, I can't. Yes, I was wondering about that. I can't make it out. What is a what is the significance of a dress? I, I don't know. It kind of looks like the cosmic I mean, spider. To me, it looked like Star Wars again. It looked like one of the Star Wars, you know, spaceships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. And doesn't it look like the cosmic spider, um, Gabe? Uh, yeah, you know that, yeah, you mean that... from the, the NACA lines, NASCA lines? Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the same what there is I, I that... don't know but it is it's symbolic of something isn't it yes mm -hmm. it's also black so she's like a black widow right spider yeah, and, and it's pointing at <laughs> it's pointing at her uh her umbilical you know her belly mm -hmm. button her place yeah center. it's it, it, again yes it's the womb therefore it's the holy grail yeah totally but I mean, we were talking about symbology of Star Wars, how you could you could uh, retell a story of the Jewish revolt within Star Wars. Well, here we have the same sort of thing yet again. We have the Bond film retelling the story of the Elagabal for some reason um, and giving it this history, which I've not seen anywhere else of the, the Elagabal, that it's the oldest stone in the universe sort of thing. Um, that it's a very lonely stone that's been, I presume, because it's not, you know, stuck in a temple, I suppose. You know, it's not in public view, so it's very lonely. It's been on its own. It was a strange... I'll have to try and find that film again and actually listen to what they said about this stone because it was very peculiar. Man, what a great presentation, Ralph. Thank you so much for this. <laughs> this is so exciting. Yeah, it's it's deep, isn't it? It just continues. It's deep and deeper. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. It's an amazing where you can go with these uh, histories, which is why history is so important. You know, there's a lot of modern society and politics is all wrapped up in this, you know. Yeah. It's part of our heritage. Heritage has come down over the millennia. Yeah. I had never heard that phrase, the Ala Cabal. That's really good. That's a great one. That's going to that's gonna fuel my research for quite a while. Thank you for that. Yeah. And it's it's a good name because it's a... It's an internet friendly name. I love these names because they're so unique. You only catch the El Gabal. It's like uh, King Abgarus. You can't catch much else. You don't get millions of hits because it's, you know, it's not James or John or something like that. All you great catch point. is Abgarus or El Gabal. So it's a great name to research. Nice. Man, that's so fascinating. I mean, it, it really is fascinating that I'm finding it. I, I'm starting to believe um, that the Plato Symposium is not as old as we're told. Uh, ah, it might have been influenced later. Yeah. Yes, I think. I mean, whatever that is based on is probably very old. But I think the French had a little hand in. Uh, <laughs> yes, in, in that the, one. Kind of repackaging it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the spider <laughs> from the Nazca lines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone from the. There's also a uh, like a star constellation one I was trying to find too, but I can't. I thought Gabe would have known that and one. I don't know of a. You know, uh, I don't know of a spider constellation, but if you find one, I'd want to know because I have found a spider in the tarot cards. It's unique. I think it's like a, it show. It's not necessarily a constellation, but it's like a, a energy pattern that is created from. I can't remember what from like a neb, like like a nebulous or nebula. Um, I, I'm not sure. Well, it Could says be. on the left there, spider constellation is Elanthropia. Oh. Well, I've never heard of that constellation. <clears throat> There's a spider nebula, yeah. There's oh, the wow. crab nebula, of course. That's the crab. The it's red spider nebula too. in Sagittarius. It's in Sag, huh? That one is. I don't know where this one is. Multiple uh, spider nebulas here? Yeah, there's multiple. <laughs> There was a confusion a long time ago between spiders, crabs, and beetles. Um, yes. So you might get cancer as being thought of as a spider, perhaps. Hmm. All arthropods. Oh, here mm. we go. Yeah, Elanthopedia. Yes, which I've never heard of. <laughs> Me neither. That is, I always love finding new constellations. There's so much going on up there. Yeah. Interesting. Said that it's all right. good stuff. Anyway, I hope um, right. viewers and listeners enjoyed the talk. Um, if yeah. any, anyone's looking for any information and books, so I'm mainly out on Amazon nowadays, um, and it it all starts with um, Jesus, Last of the Pharaohs. Tempest and Exodus, Eden in Egypt. And then it goes on to the New Testament uh, with Cleopatra to Christ, King Jesus, Jesus, King of Edessa, and then the Arthurian book, which is the Grail Cipher, which is very interesting. And they're quite large. Some of them are 500 pages. You know, they're well-researched, a lot of information. Uh -huh. um, yeah, <laughs> and a lot of references. So all of my details... Yeah, that sort of size. <laughs> um, all of this research comes from original sources. So I've I've gathered a lot of critics, as one does when you're pushing the boundaries a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, so I've gained a lot of critics, but it's very difficult for them to criticize this in depth because everything comes from original sources. The only thing that I've changed is the standard interpretation. Um, so, rather bizarrely, 
because I do this from a, a secular basis, not a religious basis. But in my Old Testament material, I've demonstrated that the Old Testament is like 90% historical. It's real history. It's just that you've got to be able to understand what it was talking yes. about. So when it's talking about Israelites, it's actually talking about the Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt, which we've not talked about yet, but we can talk about later. Because Josephus says that the Israelites were the Hyksos. Well, why not believe him? You know, Joseph has said so. Why not run with that? And that's what I've done. I run with that. Um, same with the New Testament. Nobody knows where this story came from because none of the characters can be found in the historical record. But under my interpretation, AD 60s interpretation, 90% of the gospel story is actually historical. It's correct. Now, I don't do anything with the spiritual side of it. That's up to people. If they want to put um, sons of God onto that, well, that's up to them. No problem at all. All I've done is prove that the gospel is based on real history, and it's the real history of the Jewish revolt. So that's a problem for believers, because what I'm saying is your Jesus is a real person. I know who he is. I can show you who he is. And they have to quite often sort of pull back from that and say, well, no, we don't want our Jesus to be the Jesus that you found <laughs> because he's supposed to be a pauper prince of peace. And what you found is a warrior monarch. But it's the same story. You just have to adjust your perception of who this guy was, and then you can join in with the rest of the fun. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, most of the books are available on Amazon. I've got a um, an active Facebook site, which is ralph.ellis.144 on Facebook. That's fairly active. I've got some videos up there of my own, which are under U uh, YouTube Ralph Ellis. And um, they come up with a thumbnail that's got a phoenix on it, a red and gold phoenix. So if you see that, then that's my um, my YouTube channel. And that's about it, really. So I try and engage with people um, and answer their questions, especially on Facebook. And um, so, yeah, I hope people enjoy it. Thank you very much, hey, this uh, is really Ralph, for, for being here. Yeah, uh, I think this was another great foundation that you laid down uh, for us to go into more stuff. You have been on the show before, and we did talk about the Hyksos and Akhenaten and uh, Skota. Uh, so uh, we, we did cover that already. Uh, so you're always welcome to come back anytime. We definitely want to have you back on again and do this again. And uh, thank you so much for being here and, and taking the time and spending three plus hours with us. We appreciate it. Uh, it's great. Oh, we, we love this kind of stuff. So this is like uh, our, our, like, you know, our chocolate Sunday right here. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you guys uh do you guys want to give shout outs to where people can find you and then uh we'll wrap it up here? Go ahead, Indy. Oh, okay. Uh my name's Indy Sage. You can check me out on Facebook. It's I N D Y. You can also find me at uh vibe tribe scribe dot wordpress dot com and check out my blog. And I love to interact. Uh feel free to reach out. Thanks, guys. Glad yeah. to be here today. Yep. Great show. Yep. My name is Gabe. Uh, my YouTube channel is Slick Dissident, and I also get down over on the One on One podcast. You'll catch me on the Spiders, Weaving Spiders Webs, uh, and Chance Garten over on the Rockfin is a good place to see me. Uh, but yeah, Ralph, it has been such a pleasure and an honor to to weave with you today. I really appreciate appreciate all your work and all your contribution. Weaving the spider's web, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And if you're not down with that, wake up.